But one way of reading this text, of course, is to look at the uh, appendices and, you know, kind of do a retrospective reading, a kind of retrospective prospective. And I've tried to, to, tonight maybe to highlight some passages, but to go through what I consider sort of crucial remarks that really speak to Heidegger. And remember, this is in 1938, this, uh, this um, um, talking date, and it was under the theme of the establishment of metaphysics in the age or in the metaphysical age of the world picture. So, you know, he is responding to a question, you know, how metaphysics is being established and reestablished during this age of the world picture. So excuse my life, but I, I needed to read. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I thought I'd go back to go to the, the appendixes. And I, I was going to do some cross referencing as well tonight, because of the, um, the uh, Descartes section to back to being in time. Um, and uh, um, as well as to some other things he did. But now that Dennis is here, first I'll preface this. Yeah, De Dennis, are you here? This, this again, 1938, I just wanted to point out some of the, uh, the, the moments with uh, National uh, Socialism, uh, you know, since this is a, a big issue. You know, Heidegger um, was uh, the, the rector of Freiburg, you know, and he gave the rectoral address entitled The Self-Assertion of the German University. For those of you interested, Adorno gave an address uh, uh, similarly uh, in the same period on nature and the role of nature in the, uh, in the institutions and on the future of the, of the educational institutions. And there are, there are differences, but there are similarities. But again, remember uh, Heidegger is following in this long line of, uh, of Fichte, the address to the German nation. This was something you do in Germany, especially if you become the rector. Uh, and at that time, it was pretty clear that he had uh, not only affiliations to the na Nazi uh, regime, but he also um, um, was, uh, you know, a, 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 a not maybe even maybe party member or certainly very supportive of National Socialism. But let me just mention a couple of things. This goes on, the self-assertion of the German university. Um, you know, also their remarks in the black notebooks. There are certainly remarks in some of the texts on the, um, that are anti-Semitic in the sense of the nomad Jews who are uprooted. Heidegger had a real thing about rootedness. And he did speak about the Jews like some Bolsheviks used to talk about Jews and finance capital. So it's not uncommon, you know, to again, project this out. And again, I'm not defending him, but just to put it into a context um, and in terms of Heidegger. So anyway, the lectures, and if you're interested in this kind of stuff, one of the best persons is Peter Gordon, um, a historian at Harvard who is very accessible. He's not, a, he's not a philosopher, he's a historian, but he's a very good historian of this period and has a relationship both to Adorno and Heidegger, which is interesting. And he is a defender of Ernst Cassira, who, you know, Heidegger argued with at Davos to set back the, the framework a little bit, the, this epic film called The Life and uh, Times of Martin Heidegger, um, back to 1929, the Davos meeting, which is very famous on the Kantian, you know, notion of the imagination and the transcendental imagination. And basically Heidegger, you know, one is following at that conference, arguing against Ernst Cassir. Yeah, and uh, you began to see the violent tendencies, if you will, and I, I mean that in kind of both the positive and negative sense. The violence being done to the text, but to extract from it or to make it move in a certain way that you know got outside the dominant thinking of the time. So this is a new kind of interpretation of Kantian linear, linear time, a, a very different, yeah, Ernst Cassira, yeah, C-A-S-S-I-E-R, yeah, Cassira, yeah, who was also very close uh, to um, Abby Warburg and, and ended up at the Warburg Institute in London and was, uh, mm. you know, knew of Benjamin's work. So there's a very interesting other, other side to this going on. And, you know, uh, but, but, but all to say, so 29, 27 is the publication of Being in Time, which pretty much guarantees Heidegger's uh, position in the German university. 1929, the Davos encounter with Cassira. 
1933, the self-assertion of the German um, university. Very, very important uh, moment uh, as well. Um, then uh, the 1930, um, um, if you will, th uh, 1930, um, uh, 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 five lectures on the introduction to metaphysics in which the famous passage, the inner greatness uh, of the movement called National Socialism is not reflect reflected in the philosophies parading around. Uh, you know, he did, he did state that at that time in the encounter with planetary technology. At the same time, he was also critiquing Junger in terms of Arbeiter, uh, the Arbeiter is the, you know, there's no distinction between labor and war or labor and the military uh, was what Junger basically was saying in his book, The Worker, which is certainly worth reading, uh, you know, and of course the notion of total, total mobilization as being part of everyday life, that the war machine is, uh, is uh, up and running. And, and I guess we could make the argument that the United States uh, and I'm, I adhere to this in 1938, got out of the quote, Great Depression, if you will, the economic depression, mm -hmm. even after all the tinkering of the liberal left uh, New Deal, uh, it took the warfare state, its beginning that we still live with today to do this, mm -hmm. right? Global mobilization was really used by the US and of course had you know, ultimately the transference of German science and technology that came here both before the end of World War II and then even in mass afterwards, you know, you had a kind of, you know, transportation, if you will, uh, a yeah. convoy, if you will, of people such as Werner von Braun, among others that came, came to the United States afterwards. So this war machine really, really built, was really built up. And of course, Robert McNamara, as you know, in the Defense Department, came out of the Ford Motor Company and became the Secretary of Defense in the 60s. And yeah, but anyway, this, these are all other stories that are, you know, but you could project, if you will, from this, this moment in Weimar and into the first moments of National Socialism. So 35, um, um, uh, you know, he also um, wrote a letter to an Israeli, uh, Solomon Zimak, in 1968, Heidegger, claiming that the, 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 the Nazi affiliation that people, uh, you know, laid on him ignored the whole of the lecture course, the introduction to metaphysics, which I have a copy of here somewhere. I put it, I don't know. Yeah, here it is. Uh, this is the, the best edition, the Polk edition, which has multiple uh, commentary if you're interested. Very famous uh, uh, lecture course, 1935, you know, after he'd had about a year as the rectoral, um, you know, of the, the director of the University of Freiburg. Um, he stepped down, by the way. He did step down as the rector um, for probably both political and uh, personal reasons. Um, you know, really, in some ways, I think he was being surveilled so actively, he got tired of that and thought he would become less visible. But he told uh, this man, Zimak, that what, what, what people had done was ignoring the whole of the lecture course, which makes clear that his position towards um, um, National Socialism as early as 1935 was ambiguously hostile, uh, you know, ambiguous already, ambiguously hostile were his words ambiguously hostile, right? And the ambiguous is probably due to the, to the fact 1936 to 1940 were his lectures on Nietzsche. And these were very coded lectures. You know, they were attended by Baumler and Alfred Rosenberg, as well as other Nazi, uh, you know, um, sham philosophers uh, came to these lectures. And, you know, you had in, in terms of the Nietzscheans in fascist Italy, Julius Evola, who was an aristocrat from back in the day, also was a promoter of Nietzsche. So you had this very right-wing Nietzscheanism that was playing out in National Socialism and in uh, fascist Italy, uh, both sides. And Baumler and Rosenberg both wrote, wrote books on, on Nietzsche and attended Heidegger's lectures. So the four years of lectures of Nietzsche were again, a way of trying to get outside of the Nazi uh, you know, uh, police uh, you know, by coding a lot of things. At the same time, he wanted to continue to teach and think, and he 
kept mentioning that. So again, I'm not really trying to defend him. I'm really not. I just would like us to have a, a, a larger picture than it's just either or he was a fascist or not. Yeah, Carl. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah th no, I, I, I appreciate you, you bringing this up. You know, I, I did some very, you know, some skimming. I, I kind of looked some of this stuff up. I went to Wikipedia and then followed various links, you know, various articles, the New York Times article that was written you know, that people referred to a lot. And it seemed to me kind of like, you know, the that that it doesn't work to sort of try and wash and you're not doing this, but try and wash Heidegger's hands of an affiliation with mm. the Nazis. I mean, he remained yeah. affiliated with them in an active way, you know, so that that that, that but it seems like the question is, what is for us in some way is what is the relationship of his politics to his philosophy? And, you know, is, is, was that affiliation somehow eminent within his philosophy, which would imply one conclusion, or was it, as Arendt said, you know, an heir that had nothing to do with his philosophy, which in some ways seems equally damning to me, mm. you know, that, that somebody could be a philosopher. And, and not notice. <laughs> right, could not notice, or that their philosophy would not, um, mm. regulate them in, you know, that philosophy is supposed to tell us ultimately how to live and what we value and the choices we make. I right. Know. Right. So anyway, no, it's a, it's, you know, maybe at some point point later we could come yeah. back to this. Yeah. yeah, it's a point, a point well taken. Um, um, you know, it, it's very, you know, again, this is a very, uh, I mean, I guess this is uh, both the, uh, the, the joy and pain of philosophy. You can go on endlessly through layers and try to think it through. I mean, of course, you can ask what is Heidegger's relationship to the political. It was certainly much more advanced in terms of its thinking than Carl Schmitt, you know, um, during this period who had wrote books on the concept of the political and was the author of political theology and of which a lot of theocracies and the, and the liberal and neoliberalism work on, um, you know, as a, a very Schmittian background. So um, that, that's one, one aspect of this. Uh, and, you know, philosophers are notorious. Uh, you know, Plato's seventh letter, uh, you know, when he went to visit his ex-students in Syracuse and time for philosophy to stay away from politics <laughs> was one, one aspect of this. But it always comes back because Aristotle wrote a politics. Plato wrote the Politia, the Republic. And in a sense, ever since then, you know, you've had this notion, especially of the great systematic philosophers. Uh, Hegel wanted his Napoleon, you know, Aristotle wanted his Alexander, you know, Marx had his Lenin, if you will, if you want to think that way. I mean, I'm not positive that that's a direct correlation. I mean, in some ways, you know, certainly the influences. And Heidegger, in some ways, did believe in the Fuhrer principle, in the, in the principle of the leader. So this is one way of going about it too, you know, but it has historical precedence. He's not alone, right? And the, 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 I guess the, our, our question is, you know, does he teach us how to think, how to think outside? Is there a path and an orientation here that can be not only uh, of use value, but also something that, you know, kind of shapes us into something new, you know? And for some of the generation, if you will, of the 60s, you know, some of the generation, the French thinking, of course, the uh, deconstructionist movement, Foucault and others, many of the post-structuralists were tremendously uh, influenced by this, um, you know, um, um, and, uh, and again, I mean, it can't just be denied, you know, put out. And, and my problem is always that it comes down to this notion of dangerous minds like Ronald Beener, who's in Toronto, who is very dangerous himself to the, 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 the history of thinking, and the other people that say we should not read him, France, uh, Fr Francois Fouré. Um, you know, there are a lot of um, a lot of people that have put this out now that Heidegger is quote a Nazi, and therefore we shouldn't read him. So to me, I think that should be dismissed because it's really you know stupid. You know, ultimately, Junger Junger was supportive in the beginning too. But Junger was one of the most creative minds and best writers of, of the period and, you know, invented an insect, uh, you know, and had an insectarium and was a cause celeb to the French. And, you know, anyway, you know, took up LSD in the 50s and was very open, 
et cetera. You know, you, you have so many cases like this. Yeah, David, please. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't, I don't want to go on endlessly about this because I'd like to get to the thinking because I, I still consider it powerful. That's one of the reasons, you know, I go back to read it. Yeah, David, yeah. Yeah, and I, I would uh, tend to agree with you. I mean, that's, you know, why I've uh, read through these essays so many times with you and uh, and Stanley and other folks around here. But um, just to uh, uh, sort of connect exactly what you were just saying to- oh, no, They don't work. It, this this stuff, you know, once I get here away from the window, it hardly streams at all. David, over here, look, listen, Dennis, I'm here now. Dennis, you can see. Dennis, Oops, sorry. No, sorry, okay. I'll, I'll yeah, mute. Okay, sorry. David Winters is speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Go ahead, David. Yeah. Uh, oh, so uh, just what you were saying about um, uh, folks arguing against Heidegger being read at all. Um, there's this is actually uh, one of the ways Heidegger is being picked up in uh, media theory at the moment is uh, a guy named Christian Fuchs, who's uh, like a very, very prolific uh, writer in the last like 10 years or so on Adorno and Marcuse and, you know, critical theory uh, applied to social media and stuff like that, um, becoming like a, a name. Um, argued in an article a couple of years ago uh, that because uh, the black notebooks demonstrate that uh, Heidegger's anti-Semitism is connected to uh, uh, the theory of technology and being in time and the question concerning technology. Fuchs argues, therefore, we should leave uh, Heidegger out of communication and media theory, which again, like I think like that's just an untenable position. Mm. Like the, the leaving somebody out who has like the roots, like it's just, how do you ignore work? Like I, I don't really, you have to deal with it one way or the other, I think. So, right. um, but that's Fuchs's argument is, is he sees a clear link between the two and because he can't de-link the anti-Semitism from uh, the theory of technology, therefore his argument is. So that's a, that, at least one of the prominent okay. arguments. Yeah, I, I know of Christopher Fuchs. This is part of, in my opinion, what I call, you know, just basically in, intellectual cancel culture. You know, I mean, this is ultimately mm -hmm. comes down. It's a kind of limitation, you know, that doesn't really, uh, doesn't really, uh, um, you know, provide anything new or, or, or thoughtful about this, you know, in so many ways. I mean, you know, one question we could ask, why is it? And I mean, this may be a, a way of really approaching this as we go forward. Why is it from, you know, the early French encounter, which includes Jean-Paul Sartre, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, a whole group of, Henri Lefebvre, who's a Communist Party member, very mm -hmm. open mind, right, in many ways. Um, then into the next generation, <laughs> Derrida, Foucault, you know, to a degree, Lacan, even though Lacan wasn't, you know, close in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, and, and being a Heideggerian, but certainly was respectful and understood it in a way. You know, then you had other other people too, uh, you know, Paul Ricoeur, uh, you know, on the other side, um, uh, et cetera. And then a whole American, uh, you know, uh, United States, uh, uh, you know, contingency that picked him up uh, from uh, 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 all the schools in continental philosophy, you know, in the United States, at Duquesne, at, at Berkeley, you know, um, at um, Pittsburgh, at uh, Tulane Studies in Philosophy, the Heideggerians there. You know, so you have to ask that question, what was the appeal, you know, I mean, you know, uh, in, in some ways, you know, of the thought, right? Aside from all the affiliation. And this is someone, again, who knew he was being watched throughout. This was not a stupid, everybody thinks, some people used to argue, oh, he's just a stupid country guy, you know, who's a brilliant philosopher, right? He, and he wrote a piece, Why I Remain in the Provinces. But this is, no, this was a very shrewd, shrewd person who knew what was going on with the language at that time. So I think, I think we should take that into account. Yeah, I don't see the anti-Semitism in technology in the uh, essence concerning technology, the question concerning technology. And then you ask yourself a question too, many generations later, Stiegler and others of this light, you know, Schloderdijk, you know, many, many people in the uh, in post, post who know all about, you know, the uncoverings of this. And this stuff was known about Heidegger in the 40s and the early 50s in France. So it's no news to a lot of these philosophers. And then it came out, you know, like I said, in philosophical journalism, a Chilean person named Victor Farias. Yeah, Dennis, yeah, yeah.
So my question is, uh, I mean, I, I think what hadn't come out are the black notebooks, really. And the French are, have just really started publishing them over about the last couple of years. And the black notebooks, as you said in the first lecture, Heidegger, we mainly know through his notebooks. And those notebooks are uh, part of them were like the first thing was 33 to 36. And with sort of Nazi kind of stuff, apparently I haven't read them, but uh, my question though is um, the Heidegger that the French are, uh, are appropriating, is that the Heidegger of uh, before the war, before this period, or do they also uh, refer to of the 50s? Well, I mean, the, the, the first Heidegger, of course, was the being in time. I mean, being in nothingness is, is basically, you know, Sartre's uh, first philosophical uh, major opus, systematic. That's 1943, tremendously under the influence of Heidegger. Right, but it's seven being enough, uh, 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 Heidegger's- uh, 1927 is being in time. Yeah. Okay, so this is before this is before that period. So, do the do the French generally appropriate the Heidegger coming after the Nazi period, or is it simply before? That's my no. They appropriate all. I mean, Deleuze, the entire Nietzsche studies that come out of France that we're all taken with Deleuze's Nietzsche. You know that that conference was really based on. Uh, uh, you know, there are two books that are fundamental to French thinking about. Uh, about Nietzsche, if you will. Uh, Heidegger's four volume study, four year, 1936 to 1940 period, absolutely crucial, right, to the French, uh, Gilles Deleuze, and the other one, of, and, 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 and others, Kloskowski, he, actually Kloskowski translated, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, being in time into French. So, you know, that's another, another person. I mean, you know, that's very, very interesting. If you've read Pierre Kloskowski, the best book I've ever read on internal recurrence by, of the same by anybody on that, that thematic is Pierre Kloskowski's uh, book on the vicious circle. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing uh, work, you know, <laughs> and he was a novelist and, a, you know, a, a sketch artist, a painter, a filmmaker, et cetera. This was really a, a very impressive uh, figure. Fred Jameson said he's the most intelligent man in the uh, 20th century. So uh, anyway, but he translated being in time into uh, into French. So you had Corbin, uh, who was, uh, you know, head of Islamic studies, who also translated an abridged version of, of being in time. So this has a very long history on the other side. So this may be, you know, look, again, I see this as a kind of cultural politics. It's a maneuvering for position to go on talk shows. I mean, I've heard some of these people, I listen to, you know, French cultural uh, TV <laughs> occasionally and how they go on about the black notebooks and all this uh, happening. But no, the, the first and second generation of um, Heideggerians in, in France are completely influenced by the Heidegger of the pre, uh, pre-1945 PP. And, and, and Heidegger was punished. He was part of the denazification. He was taken away. He could not teach and do, again until 1951. It was restored. So I, I, again, I want to point that out too. It's not like he was put in this position of, um, of uh, you know, oh, you're okay with us. He went before the denazification board. He was he, it, it was taken away because of his association. But still, again, the the thought is there, right? In a way. So anyway, for me. I'm sorry to say it this way. I mean, I'm going to be vulgar, but to me, this is a lot of waste of academic paper at a certain level because ultimately, where where are we going to go with it? Are we not going to read this thinker that basically had this ability, right, to think through things in terms of how we got here, how we are here now, right, in a sense? Does that mean all of this is wrong? Is thinking about representation? Is thinking about you know? Uh, against the truth is the correspondence theory. Is his, is his um, you know, methodology all off? All of these questions to me are much more interesting than, okay, he has, a, he has a, an affiliation uh, uh, with this. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, like I said, 
it's very problematic. But again, I, I think this this is is a time waster. It's like reading the fuck, excuse my language, the New York Times endlessly to get your information. It's old, old news, and it's being wrapped in a new new wrapper going forward, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, to, to my mind, yeah. And I mean, you know, uh, um, in, in a lot of ways, uh, the more interesting encounters would be on the theories of reification in Lukacs and its connection to Heidegger's being in time on ready to hand and present in hand and that relationship to reification that both comes out of Cartesian rationality. And these would be interesting conversations, at least to me, about labor, labor value, you know, how we're able to, to um, you know, think through things that are very prescient. Yeah. And in a way, I mean, we're living, I mean, maybe he can help us since we're living in this world that has been enclosed so much and much and more. And we don't have it. First, fascism's a minor league term compared to what we're going through right now in some ways. I mean, you know, this, this, uh, this, uh, this world uh, right now. Yeah, yeah, in some ways. And, you know, so anyway, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, but, I, I, but I think it's very important that we, uh, you know, divide up his period. You know, there was none of these hints after the war in a way, and the letter on humanism and anthropology could be one way of looking at it, that being his Socratic apology in some ways, that he's really saying that the humanist endeavor has failed, look what it led, led to, or the metaphysics of the will to power. I mean, he's talking about this, you know, he's, he's talking about American giganticism, you know, he, he speaks to national socialism in the appendixes, and again in the, um, in the uh, in, in 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 other places and in letters, so someone put in the chat about Hannah Arendt. I don't think she ever really distanced herself to him. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, I, I just uh, you know I think Phil asked uh, asked that question as analogy. Phil, she was extremely influenced by him. If you read the Human Condition, that's a, that is a kind of an extension of what Heidegger maybe thought of the political. You know, in uh, in uh, in uh, you know, rent takes that up uh, many ways. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, and she she defended him to the very end. Yeah, in a sense, right? Uh, I mean, not not as not as you know, <laughs> not 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 his time thirty three to thirty five, if you will, or thirty six, the high periods. And I don't know if the black notebooks were out there, et cetera. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, don't don't know. Yeah, you know, it's like you know, to me, sometimes it gets to the point. I, I know it's a different level, but it's like saying Marx couldn't feed his children and therefore two two left, you know, died, or Marx sleeps with a maid, right? And you know, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, it becomes kind of you know after a while. But anyway, we can we can go back to it. Maybe we can detect something in the reading. But again. Uh, these are the things that, you know, at least in my opinion, the careers are made on, you know, the, this guy, uh, you know, in, in France, these people in France right now are really going after this very much, right? For, uh, you know, and, and they've been doing this for the last eight to 10 years. You know, this has been a, a major, major thematic out there. Yeah. Um, on Heidegger. Again, I, I, I want to go back, but let, let, let's go to the text. Unless there are any other comments about this, I, I just want to say, you know, the, the main period of this association, if you will, um, you know, and, and it is it is there. I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not one to deny it. If I was a court, you're guilty as charged, uh, Heidegger, et cetera, from 33 to 36. And, you know, but there's a movement out of that. And Heidegger's concern is more about the, 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 the spirit, if you will, of, of Germania, right? Of Germany, of Germania. He goes back and he starts to read Holderly. He's very much into rootedness, the homecoming of, 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 of Holderly. And of course, the movie Der Ister is very much on that level too. You know, um, if, you, if you've heard him, uh, you know, do his lecture and, and the reading of Der Ister, that's in the, uh, in the film by Daniel Ross. Um, so, um, yeah, and 30, to me, there's a turn that starts around 36, 37. He understands the reductionistic 
attitudes of the Nazis. He begins to see what's going on. He's passive. He doesn't fight directly like a Junger or other people that got, you know, that got into this. He did not read, uh, lang he did not write language in the Third Reich. He wrote it in a different way than Victor Klemperer did. You know, and uh, um, and I always refer to this book. I'm, unfortunately, it's not translated. La the uh, totalitarian languages by Jean-Pierre Fayi actually goes through this too. Uh, so these are all very important things. But again, yeah. So by '51, he can teach his seminars again. You know, and he he goes out and he begins with a, a seminar on Heraclitus. Uh, he begins you know, to teach these things and gives many talks. So the question concerning technology is 55, right? In, in 1955. And it seems to me his shift, if you will, is an encounter with cybernetics, the dominance of cybernetics, you know, after the war, yeah? You know, his antagonists become Norbert Wiener, right? The positivist tradition. You know, I mean, he always had the positivist as his thing, but cybernetics become sort of the enemy to Heidegger, the, the chief antagonists. And, you know, and uh, David Winters is in a program, you know, uh, communication, uh, the cybernetic uh, moment is so prevalent there in so many ways and uh, all, all aspects, right? Yeah. And, you know, you could ask about Freud, who, who couldn't stand his, uh, you know, his nephew, Edward Bernays, because there probably was this, you know, thinking this man's using my thought as cybernetics and manipulation and exploitation, right, in, in a way. And, uh, yeah, you can think of that early on, too. So, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. So I, I want to just go back to the text. Uh, you know, maybe we can turn to the appendix. Uh, you know, uh, again, um, let me just... Um, let me just say that the encounters with Junger, to me, conservative revolution, and I think it's better. I mean, look, for maybe for our purposes, and I'll hold to this, uh, trying to be as open as possible. Maybe we should just look at this as a moment of conservative revolution and keep the Nazi ideology out of it. This was conservative revolution. Carl, Ernst Junger and Heidegger being two of the major figures, Carl Schmitt, in my opinion, being part of that triumvirate, but a much left, lesser thinker. And then there are a lot of people around this conservative revolution that are in Italy, including the Italian Nietzscheans, um, Giulio Savola, among others. You know, Avola wrote many books about uh, Nietzsche. Yeah, and this has a long, long history in the occult in the 19th century. You know, there's there's a very very you know active active uh, you know uh, um, historical background to this. All right. So anyway, so the encounters with Junger, both in '31 and '32, was the on mobilization and the worker, and uh, you know the fundamental characteristic mobile total mobilization is the modern warfare state, and uh, and this is where Junger basically said the war and labor front are identical, right? For Heidegger, he sees this again in terms of his apocal thinking as the final realization of the will to power. This is the metaphysics of the will to power and that Nietzsche is the last metaphysician. Okay, so really the trace of the history of philosophy, the way Heidegger reads it is from Plato to Nietzsche and what happens in what's called destiny or destinal sending in Heidegger, of which we are openness. We're not, quote, individuals or whatever. We're openness. <laughs> That's what we are. We're da. We're their openness, right? And the question is, where is <laughs> that openness, right? And the thereness of, of this moment. So this is what he's always thinking, trying to think through. And this is as early as, as 27 and being in time, and probably even earlier, but being in time, he has the existential analytic you know, uh, going back to that. So anyway, so Nietzsche, you know, Hegel is the last great systematic philosopher. There's a closure on representation in the history of philosophy. And Nietzsche is the last metaphysician. So you see this playing out from Plato to Nietzsche. And this was the wrong turn, if you will. Do you want to think of this? Althusser has a great term that I like. Philosophy is the great detour. Right. But for, for Heidegger, the philosophy from Plato to Nietzsche took the long, wrong turn. And it ended up in this metaphysics, 
of theirness, right, if you will, what came to us as this kind of ultimately um, um, this will to power, the giganticism, etc. And you could think of the Nazi regime and the ideology as being one of the triumph of the will. The will is absolutely essential, you know, in everything from Riefenstahl's movies to, you know, probably ever other verb, you know, uh, work will make you free, right, etc. Which is replayed very interesting by Maximilian Schell. I really recommend this movie. I was I really taken, I, I was mentioning earlier, The Man in the Glass Booth. I watched it last night, you know, again, for a, after a long time away from it. Um, but anyway, so again, this is, this is where he sees it and he sees the world right now in terms of the metaphysics of both the will to power and active nihilism that we're really in this moment of active nihilism. So you could maybe start reading late capital as a period, if you will, of a combination of the will to power, this Promethean will that there are no limits, you know, always power first, and also active nihilism, right? In a sense, yeah. Unlike Nietzsche, I would say that Nietzsche, one thing that I like is the cheerful nihilism, that at least you can laugh and, you know, you know, we'll put some bleachers in the sun and hold it on Highway 61, you know. Uh, but anyway, you know, the, 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 the carnivalesque and the ability to have the comedic in this sometimes is lacking in, in Heidegger, but, the, you know, the cheerful nihilistic moment. But anyway, this is very important to keep in mind. Again, if you can think of this, differently as this is a, a thereness. It's an openness in a thereness. The da is the thereness of openness. This is what it is, the open. And he refers to the open three or four times in the appendices, especially towards the last part, the last, uh, the last section, um, the open um, as, um, as the openness for being. Uh, Appendix 15. But I'd like to go through these unless someone wants to start with something that really hit them. You know, I mean, the first the first one is basically him setting the, 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 the stage, right, uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the document. And then we can read it backwards. Um, just, and just I love these phrases. Things. Yeah, yeah, Carl, yeah, please. Yeah. Just yeah. one thing. Yeah, I mean, what, what, I, I found, you know, did a, I looked at some other things he's written, um, and it, it's interesting. Like, what is the underlying concern or project? Like, like there's a there's a problematic that's underlying the first part of the text that I think he begins to lay out some of these appendices, but not fully. It seems it would be helpful to try and excavate more fully that problematic because the text is very much, you know, he's, it, it seems to me he's trying to think about a certain determination of being, but underneath that, there's something that he seems disturbed by, right? That his whole philosophical project seems to be an attempt to move beyond or overcome. And and I don't understand how all these things. Well, out. again, I, I mean, I'm still I'm still thinking that this is the Heidegger of the diagnostic, rather than the. Uh, right of, of the thinking through representation. The, uh, Companies all its representations. Of course, the cartoon, you know, the cartoon. Things that work again, show where age how to the point of the world picture or the world image, right? How, how, how did we get into this kind of thinking? How are we inspired by this? It'll be extended in the question concerning technology in a more, you know, maybe rooted way. But here it's about how did we get to this point of where the will to the world is as representation, right? He wants to rid us of the will in a certain way. Yeah, in a way. This is something that he finds to be, you know, part of the problem. <laughs> right, in terms of domination, in terms of uh, you know over over um, um, 
uh, overcoming. The will is not really an overcoming. We need to overcome this kind of thinking of the will, you know, in many ways. So again, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so sure. So the, the problematics are really around science that does not think or think its conditions really, but it is ongoing research itself. He has many, many phrases about this. There's of course this attack on what we were talking about earlier, philosophical journalism, such as some of these French people are engaged in, in my opinion, with the black notebooks in, in some ways. Um, and, uh, and also of course, you know, trying to then describe the open versus that of, you know, the closed horizon in some, you know, in a different way. So it's a very different way of thinking outside the box. Let me hear from Patrick and then David, and uh, I'll come back to you, Carl. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in part to answer Carl, I yeah. mean, some of, some of the background here is, is he, he, in the first part of the essay, he talks about explanation in the historical sciences. Right. And in, in at this point in time, well, actually, in early part of, of the 19th century, there was a whole discussion about the distinction between explanation and, and understanding. And the, the notion of explanation is much more um, guided by natural scientific methodology. And right. that is really what he's, he is attacking. Right. He, he actually did his, his, I don't know what you would call it, his earlier thing on Duns Scotus under a guy named Rickert, who- Rick Rickert, yeah. Yeah, who is more, more interested in this notion of understanding, which is a matter of, of empathy and values and stuff like that. So he's really, what he's trying to get at, and he, and he inherits this, but he's taking it in a different direction, and in a way kind of radicalizing it. At least, at least this is my understanding of what's going on. Yeah, and if you want an extension on what uh, Patrick is talking about in the kind of the, the modern, uh, you know, extension of the Frankfurt School, Habermas wrote a book on justification and explanation in mm -hmm. which what Patrick is referring to takes up. Well, I'm not referring to that. I'm referring back, I'm going back. No, no, I know you are. Yeah, I'm just but... saying that he, he takes into account that historical moment of the 19th century I, with empathy. I just don't want you to tie Heidegger. I'm not Heidegger, but Habermas to me. Okay. I agree with you, I agree. <laughs> I'm giving it to Carl since he's into explanation a lot. You know, Heidegger is not into explanation. <laughs> he's not, he's no. not really in a way, you know, this is an attack on causality too. Our, our exactly. Our and that's where that's where that's causality. where Diltai comes in yes, in terms yes. of the human science or Geistes Wissenschaft. Mm -hmm. So he's really kind of grappling with this whole issue. And I think this yeah. actually ties back into the whole controversy controversy with Kasira. Because Kasira's yeah. whole thing was essentially, I think in some ways you can read this first half of the essay is directed against Kasira. But anyway, that's so. Well, that's very true. And positivism, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 No, it's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kassira wrote, uh, you know, this is against epistemology in a way to play on one of Adorno's books, too, right? In the sense, you know, Kassira was a Kantian and he was a very intelligent Kantian, you know, no, no sm small uh, potatoes, as our friend Aronowitz used to say. But he, he you know, Kassira wrote a book called The Problem of Knowledge. Heidegger wanted to deconstruct knowledge and the way knowledge came to be. This is very important to remember. And this is a tremendous influence on Adorno and Horkheimer in my, my, my view. You know, Heidegger is the one that kind of leveled the ground on this uh, in so many ways in terms of the, the problem of epistemological epistemology. But uh, Patrick's absolutely correct and thank you so much. This is about, you know, critiquing methodology, the natural sciences, right? Heidegger had no truck with the social sciences, I mean, you know, in so many ways, obviously. And uh, but but anyway, yeah. So th this again is is part of the stakes, and it goes back to Dilthey. And he actually has many encounters. I can give you the references in being in time with Dilthey and this notion of both understanding and the framing of the di and the the uh, the, uh, the construction of the disciplines. Okay, David, go ahead. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we we can yeah around the corner here. Yeah, yeah I was just um, uh, trying to note quickly, uh, like a couple of moments within the, the essay um, that uh, 
we can sort of put next to each other um, to try to identify like what what Heidegger's argument against like research is and what the alternative um, that he's sort of like picturing or, or arguing is, right? Yep. Um, and just like, I, I don't want to read like, I don't want to read too much of it at all actually, but like, um, oh, my pages are different too. Um, what number is it? Is it the appendix or is it in the text? No, in the text. So I'm just looking at uh, in the text about halfway through, I think when he talks about the objectifying of whatever it is, so it's the start of a paragraph is accomplished in a setting before. This objectifying of whatever is is accomplished in a setting before? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, page 127 in our in, okay. in the, uh, right. translation, yeah. yeah. Mine as well. So I'll just read like two sentences of this. Sure. That, um, uh, in a setting before of representing that aims at bringing each particular being before it in such a way that man who calculates can be sure, and that means be certain of that being. We first arrive at science as research when and only when truth has been transformed into the certainty of representation. And he goes on a, a little bit later to talk about how the world picture is like that, um, like thought that calculates the entire world or tries to, to, to see the entire world as something that can be calculated and made certain in, in that same way. And then on just as a quick comparison to what he's setting that against, on 130 and 131, uh, he talks about how the world picture uh, doesn't change from an earlier medieval one in the like middle of the uh, first full paragraph on 130, that the world picture does not change from an earlier medieval one into a modern one, but rather the fact that the world becomes picture at all is what distinguishes the essence of the modern age. Um, and then at the end of that paragraph, um, uh, you know, in fact, the world is, is placed in the realm of man's knowing and of having and of his having disposal and that it is in being only in this way. And then finally, the last one on page 131 uh, as the alternative, right? The Greek vision of, I, right, that's what he's saying is the Greek vision of man as the one being looked upon by the world rather than, you know, being able to become certain of the world by representing it through specific scientific, quote unquote now, scientific processes, right? The vision instead is that like we're supposed to understand ourselves as being seen by, as being gazed upon by the world, not like having the world at our disposal so we can calculate it and do whatever the hell we want with it. Who knows where that goes? Because what I think he's sure of is we have no idea where that goes, though saying that we know where that goes is the whole basis of that kind of thought, right? So he's trying to get us totally out of that and say, hey, like the only alternative I can come up with is what the Greeks were, were thinking. And they were thinking that the world gazes upon them, not that they calculate the world. So like, I don't know, maybe we can do something with that, right? Like, right. And I mean, I, I think if you go down, yeah, good. That uh, on page 131, the, the next paragraph is, is crucial in the sense of the notion and the opposition that he sets up between apprehending actual learning <laughs> versus that of representing being in the scene. Right, it's a very interesting, very interesting thing. You put man puts himself into the scene, gets into the picture, right, etc. You know, we say we need a seat at the table. That's another thing Heidegger would laugh at and just, you know, put in the vernacular here to to, to go on. Yeah. So th this is very good. It's a very good section to look at in terms of uh, apprehending in the Greek sense versus that of representing in the modern sense and the connections to calculative rationality. Because the stake here is really calculative rationality. You can call it capitalism as a system, of course, right? He, he doesn't use this language, right? For him, it's based on philosophical conceptions, not conceptions in political economy. Yeah. Yeah, Dennis. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. I just will take up as calculability, you know, um, <clears throat> and there's a there's a line at the end of the of uh, second appendix, uh, which does make it sort of explicit, but where within constant activity is research to discover a counterbalance to mere busyness that a lot of this is mere busyness you know, uh, and, uh, you know, that's sort of, that's sort of the value, that's sort of the value of calculability is just sort of mere busyness, you know. Right, no, good, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and also the thing that you just said, the thing about, uh, what did you say, the be, uh, being in, 
the place where it happens or what did you say? Yeah, being on the scene, putting yourself in the scene. <laughs> yeah. Right, being in the scene, you know, we can refer to that that main the main song in Hamilton where the character wants to be in the room where it happens. Oh boy, okay. It's a vacuous phrase that means nothing. Right, right. I but it you. is being on the scene, the room where it happens. Yeah. It's a ridiculous phrase and a ridiculous song, which means nothing, but which is taken now as meaningful. Okay. It used to be Hank Paulson was the loudest guy in the room at Goldman Sachs, right? <laughs> the guy that helped bring you the uh, financial crisis. And then he, he, he un un uh, did the spigots to let the money flow again. Yeah, Richard, yeah, please, yeah. Oh, I just gonna say that it also, you know, it reminds me of kind of the, the uh, structure of, of tragedy around vision and blindness, you know, that Mm -hmm. um, just as Thucydides can be read as uh, you know, of, of having an underlying uh, paradigm of tragedy to uh, his history, here too, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, he's saying, well, they're kind of getting up, modern man is getting up high on his horse through this sense of ADOS, of seeing, of vision, right. but is unaware that there's a kind of Right, ironic tragic, uh, ironic quality to it because he's unaware of that in, in in this sense in his busyness and in his constant uh, activity of looking, uh, you know, from the view from the viewpoint of philosophy, from the viewpoint of being where Heidegger is coming from, uh, it's a he's in fact uh, headed for a fall. Right. I mean, it's a it's a tragic. Uh, would you agree? Uh, yeah, I would agree. But also, it's not even it's not just the disaster that's about to happen. It's the disaster that has happened. Right. right. This is this is the Heideggerian moment, if you will. You know, the disaster has happened, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Right. It's like in those those yeah. uh, comics where the, the coyote runs off the cliff and he doesn't yet know he's standing in the air, that he's off the cliff. Right. Yeah. I remember, yeah, I, Wiley Coyote knew he was whether he was going to go off the cliff or not, though. You know, yeah, <laughs> in animation. But but anyway, yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, you know, look, he, he, he thinks we're on the abyssal plane. We're in the Abgrund. We're not at the Grund. He's trying, you know, to go back to Carl in a way. The, the the project here is to try to get back to some kind of Grund from the Abgrund, or at least understand that relationship where we are, right? In a sense. And you know, you can talk about it as, as a kind of nostalgia, nostos for Germania, right? Or uh, the Odyssean travels home. <laughs> you know, in ancient Greece, you know, in the earlier notions of Nostos, but it really is a return to home, to not beyond Heimat, you know, it's the losing of this, you know, it's a really, it's a, for Heidegger, it's a sickness, it's a pathology, a metaphysical pathology that we're experiencing, a sickness that needs to, you know, be redressed, right? And he, he's not sure he has the step-by-step -step approach to it, but it is something that is, you know, coming, has come down already, yeah? So you have terms such as Carl Jaspers used this ship, shipwrecked, right? This, this is in the, in the air in the 1920s, right? In Weimar, as well as, you know, globally, right? Uh, but, you know, yeah, and, but his, and his focus on vision, I was just reading uh, yeah. his student, uh, who I think was the first husband of Hannah Arendt, uh, Gunther Anders. Yeah, Gunther Anders was uh, Hannah Arendt's first for husband. Yeah, definitely. right. Who goes yeah. on? I love his stuff on television. He's smart. He, yeah. Oh my gosh, he's yeah. he has this one article, Matrix and the Phantom. You know, I just love the piece. I mean, he's so ahead of what he's what he's thinking about in terms of television and saying, you know, the cinema. People, uh, you know, people think it was a great idea to assemble people to sell them something, but no, this is a complete impediment. What you need is them isolated, and I mean, it's just so prophetic—a piece written in 1950s. But you know, what I also see him in terms of it. Also, you know, it for me it brings out 
you know, what ironically you could say is outside the frame of Heidegger at this period, you know, which we'll see in some of these other authors, Walter Benjamin too, about images, about Bild, you know, that just the, um, you know, the omnipresence of, of images. Uh, I, you know, I just saw uh, the only uh, film Max Ophel's made in Italy, uh, La, La, La Signora di Tutti, the, the Woman of Us All, yeah. great right. film. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's focus on images and the way that they've kind of, of uh, come to dominate culture in a way that, was completely uh, disruptive and unexpected. So even though he doesn't talk about, I mean, he does talk obviously, you know, about ADOS and this, the Greek, uh, you know, the etymological link of, uh, right. between seeing and knowledge. So, and you know, build, he, he uh, leaves outside of the frame, so to speak, this whole question of mass culture, which of course, uh, many of the other thinkers at that time will focus on, um, and, and his student, Gunther Anders. Um, but so it's, it's, you know, striking. Right. Again, I mean, Heidegger's objects, if you want to think of it this way, of inquiry, or at least the, the things he was reading, you know, he obviously had a very deep relationship to Holderling, to Frederick Holderling, to po poetry, right, in many ways. This yes, was one of his 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 primary. He he wanted to hear the poem again. You know, he wasn't so much into the verbs of seeing right as much. He under understood basically what you, you're thinking that the history of Western philosophy, in some ways, could be narrativized around the the histoire du, the, the of the eye, right? <laughs> the story of the eye. You know, and in some ways, the pornographic eye in Husserlian, you know, where the reductions are getting to the thing itself always, and it becomes a new new kind of uh, way of seeing, right? So in, in a way, Heidegger, even though he's attuned to this phenomenological method and this new way of seeing, he really wants to get back to a, a sense that he feels very underdeveloped, that we have lost the ability to hear. Right, we have lost the ability to really listen, you know. So this this is very very important to keep in mind, and why I think again, look, I, I know we like to read quickly. I know we like to you know absorb as much as we can. This is part of our giganticism, our you know our trainings, our projections. But at the same time, he really wants us to take it very slow to really peruse each one. You know, one of his great essays, and I, I didn't assign it, but it's really worth reading, is Building, Dwelling, Thinking. You know, this triad is a very beautiful essay on constructing, living, and, 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 and thinking in that relationship, you know, where he makes crucial distinctions between to build and to dwell. Right. And you dwell, you know, and as, as you know, one of his most famous proposition is language is the house of being. Right. Yeah. Language is the house of being. So, again, this this hearing that is always, uh, you know, uh, uh, going on. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, Dennis, did you want to say something else? I see your hand still up or, or is that? Yeah. Dennis. Yeah. You there. Or? Are you there? Are you openness and thereness in the in the, in the being in the world? Um, I guess. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have to keep going back and forth on my stupid Apple in terms of pictures, and I can't figure out how to get both of them up on the screen at the same time. Uh, yeah. Uh, just to, uh, again, he sort of talks uh, in the since we're sort of in the appendix, I guess you know. He talks about publishers. Oh no, I'm sorry. I wanted to go to this thing about systems, that uh, this domination of system. Uh, let's see. Um, Very important. Yeah, I was going to yeah, go. It, please. Yeah. It can be really destructive because right. system takes over and destroys. You know. Um, let's see. Where system takes the lead, however, there. Ex always exists the possibility of its degeneration into the externality of a system that is merely fabricated and pieced together. And I think that's kind of what he's seeing, you know, 
uh, that's what he's talking about. You know, Adorno would call Adorno when he talked about this would talk about um, the uh, you know sort of institutionalization and um, oops uh, again I got this stupid thing. Oh, by the way, I'm being plagued by a system itself. I'm being plagued by the system of Apple. Those fuckers just do not leave you alone. All it's all the system is all about directing you to the Apple store. You know, I already paid my fucking one thousand dollars. I don't need to go to the goddamn Apple store every minute. It's just talk about image and pictures. My God, you know, the way this stuff controls your life and the way it just directs you more and more, you know, to this. I mean, it's just like it's it's a mall. It's a mall on your screen. Anyway, well, is right about this. We, we have empirical uh, evidence uh, then uh, for this. Yeah. He's okay. definitely right about it. And I agree with what Richard said about the idea that, you know, the, the dominance of the image. I mean, I'm I'm in Hollywood right now and there is nothing here but the image. There is no substance. You know, no, it, it just it's just incredible when you when you go outside and you see the billboards, you know, and it's all television now. It's no longer film. You know, you'll, occasionally you'll see you'll see one uh, billboard of film, and then you'll see fifteen television series. You know, so it's it's sort of passed over into that. But but even the thinking that the the picture has sort of penetrated the thinking. The thinking here is very very muted. You know, and it's all designed around the power of the picture. You know, yeah. and of making for, that for, for Heidegger, there is no thinking and picture. Yeah. It's it's That's just the whole point. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just in making that that real, you know, it's uh it's a very, very strange thing here, you know. Anyway. And and where did you see the systems in the uh, uh, in the appendix which you were referring to initially? Yeah, I think it's in footnote, I think it's in footnote six. Uh, is, uh, six? I mean, yeah, okay, yeah. No, this this is a very important thing. Um, uh, maybe I should read this. This is a, a good uh, good section maybe to get reacclimated to the text. So this is number six. This is on um, uh, page uh, 141 and I, we, we can back up to Descartes as well in, in, in the next few minutes too. But whatever, what belongs properly to the essence of the picture is standing together system, right? Standing hyphen together system. By this is not meant the artificial and the external simplifying and putting together of what is given, but the unity of structure in that which is represented as such a unity that develops out of the projection of the objectivity objectivity of whatever is. In the Middle Ages, the system is impossible for there is a ranked order of correspondences is alone essential. Their ranked order of correspondences is alone essential. And indeed is an ordering of whatever is in the sense of what has been created by God and is washed over as his creature. So this is the great chain of being obviously he's referring to. The system is still more foreign, that is to the Greeks, right? Even if in modern times we speak though quite wrongly of the Platonic and Aristotelian system. This is, this is good, or systems. Ongoing activity and research is a specific bodying forth. I like that phrase too, you know, it's kind of like, a, um, you know, Merleau-Ponty's comporting oneself, the comportment, but bodying forth is nice, very nice. Uh, Wilhelm Reich could have abused that in a different, yeah, in a good way. And ordering of the systematic in which at the same time, the latter reciprocally determines the ordering. Very, very important there, right? The ordering, the latter, right? Reciprocally determines the ordering. Where the world becomes picture, the system, and not only in thinking, comes to dominance. However, where the system is in the ascendancy, the possibility always exists also of its degenerating into the superficiality of a system that has been merely fabricated and pieced together. This takes place when the original power of the projecting is lacking. And this is very good what he does with, you know, very simply modern you know, philosophy since, uh, yeah, uh, since Descartes. The uniqueness of the systematic in Leibniz, in Kant, 
Fichte, Hegel, and Schelling, a uniqueness that is inherently diverse is still not grasped. The greatness of the systematic in these thinkers lies in the fact that it unfolds not as in Descartes out of the subject as ego or substantia finita, but either as in Leibniz out of the monad or as in Kant out of the transcendental essence of finite understanding rooted in the imagination or in Fichte out of the infinite eye, or as in Hegel out of spirit as absolute knowledge, or as in Schelling out of freedom as the necessity of every particular being as such a being remains determined through the distinction between ground and existence. The representation of value is just as essential, right? This is very good as the modern interpretation of that which is as in the system. When anything that it has become the object of representing, it first incurs in a certain manner, a loss of being. And it's very interesting how value works. This loss is adequately perceived, if but vaguely and unclearly, and is compensated for with corresponding swiftness through the fact that we impart value to the object and to that which is interpreted as object. That we take the measure of whatever is solely in keeping with the criterion of value and make a value that's themselves the goal of all activity. Since the latter is understood as culture, this is good, culture and value. You know, Wittgenstein wrote a very good uh, uh, little pressy called Culture and Value on this very matter as well. So since the latter values become cultural values, and those in turn become the very expression of the highest purposes of creativity in the service of man's making himself secure as subictium. From here, it is only a step at making values into objects themselves. Value is the objectification of needs as goals, brought by a representing self-establishing within the world as picture. Value appears to be the expression of the fact that we, in our position of relationship to it, act to advance just that was itself most valuable. And yet that very value is the impotent and threadbare disguise of the objectivity of whatever is. An objectivity that has become flat and devoid of background. No one dies for mere values. We should note <laughs> for the sake, maybe that's a play of the Nazis too, right? We should note for the sake of shedding light on the 19th century, the peculiar in-between position of Hermann Lutz, who at the time, same time that he was reinterpreting Plato's ideas as values. So uh, Richard, uh, you know, Eidos becomes value here, right? And image becomes value, right? Undertook under the title Microcosmos that attempted an anthropology, 1856, which still drew substance to the nobility and the straightforwardness of its motive for the spirit of German idealism, yet also opened that thinking to positivism. This is, this is interesting, right? Because Nietzsche's thinking remained imprisoned in value representation, and this is open to question. I mean, you know, I certainly have some things here, but anyway, he has to articulate what is essential for him in the form of a reversal as the reevaluation of all values. You know, this is, of course, the, 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 the book, an attempted reevaluation of all values, or what he calls the transvaluation of all values, right? It's both an attempt, but also a transvaluation of all values. So you can read this at, at different levels. But anyway, only when we succeed in grasping Nietzsche's thinking independently of value representation, do we come to a standing ground from which the work of the last thinker, and this is again important, of metaphysics becomes a task assigned to questioning. And Nietzsche's antagonism to Wagner becomes comprehensive as a necessity of our history. This is very good, a good section to, 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 to tackle Dennis, uh, you know, in my mind, because he covers so much ground here, you know, in terms of the history of uh, philosophy since Cartesianism. And then of course, you know, looking again at Nietzsche as the last metaphysician because of value representation, that he still remains in representational thinking, you know, as, as, as the last metaphysician in many ways. So this, this is a, a very, very important section, right? Uh, I mean, any, anybody wanna, you know, uh, uh, think about that? I mean, to, to, to comment on this or 
some thoughts about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, Heidegger is the thinker of being, right? The, this is his one thought, <laughs> the thinking of being. Being speaks us. Language speaks us, you know, in, in terms of Freud and Lacan and, and different, you know, in that way. So we are, you know, in, in a sense that there, that stands there, right? Or is there through which the open passes. And that, that's another, you know, uh, proposition that he goes through later, you know, uh, you know, the uh, number 15, the open between is the openness for being the word understood in the sense of the ecstatic realm of the revealing and concealing of being. So the opening and closing is at the end of this, right? In terms of how one escapes this picture thinking, this age of the world picture, why one breaks that frame in many ways, you know? This is, this is a, you know, a question to just the, the definition of system and how do people see that i mean in one way a system you could say is just an ordered arrangement of elements and you know a certain set of relations between them and he seems to be using system more in terms of you know the the cartesian philosophical anthropology and the whole notion of representation it seems like you know that that's kind of the key link and i just wondered if other people also and, and then, you know, it's, it seems like that leads to a certain understanding as, as the world is rendered an object of calculation, sort of the instrumentality of thinking. And that's when it loses some characteristic, which he seems to want to recover. But I, I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking out loud a little bit, but it goes back to the earlier thing. I think uh, David raise it quite well of sort of this return to the early Greeks, this return to this different conception of the world. And it's interesting to me that that's where he goes with this. And and why does he go there at, you know, as sort of as he's, he, he's rendering this diagnosis. But he gives a definition, Carl. He says, again, at the beginning of Proposition 6, what belongs properly to the essence of the picture is the standing together. So standing together, hyphenated, is system. But this is not meant the artificial and um, external simplifying and putting together of what is given. So this givenness and this ordered arrangement into a system, but the unity in the structure that happens in what is represented as such, right? Right? A so unity develops out of the projection of the objectivity of whatever is. Right, that, that's his working, you know, definition of system throughout this. Then he returns to ranked order, the great chain of being in the Middle Ages, as not, you know, and the system itself is foreign to the Greeks. Yeah, because we, we speak wrongly of this standing together, this unity of structure that we have in Plato and Aristotle. For Heidegger, there's no such thing. Right in the ancient Greek for the, the yeah he he um on page one one thirty two he talks about representing and I mean this just seems you know central to kind of what I'm seeing him try to do is to represent is to set before oneself and to set forth in relation to oneself right and that that <clears throat> that seems to be very linked to his critique of Cartesian the Cartesian subjectivity, right? But this, th these seem to be different terms for something similar, that, that there's, there's a similar critique going on with all these things. Hmm. To represent means to bring what is present at hand before oneself as something standing over against, to relate it to oneself, to the one representing it, so he's not like talking about like representation in the way I think it's commonly used today is like, you know, a kind of like almost more Saussurean sense that, you know, the sign that I, I think he's talking about something very different than uh, that. That's how I read it, that, that it's, it's when, when you actually look at what he means by representation, it's a certain mode of kind of constituting ourselves in relation to being. 
or vice versa, in which something has been lost. Who was going to say something? I'm sorry. I heard some appendix nine is is this is the appendix on representation where he breaks it down. Yeah, it's actually one of the more difficult sections. I was going to bring it up. Yeah, so yeah we could wait if you want to get get through. No, some no, no, you could stay on this because this is a really the the again representation is the crucial term and the problematization here in this uh, thing. So yeah, nine nine actually, how does it happen at all? that which displays itself as a pronounced matter as sub ictum. This is on page 147. And this is after he's gone on the measurement, he goes through a long historical digression, I say, and he goes through metaphysical positions that embrace the Pythagorean and the Cartesian moment. And, you know, man is a metron, man is measure. Man is the measure of all things. Again, so how did it, and that is a consequence, the subjective, achieves dominance. How does this happen? So we're up to Descartes and also still within his metaphysics, this is 148 at the top, that which insofar as it is the particular being, a particular sub ictum, a hypo uh, chemon, right? Is something lying before from out of itself, which as such simultaneously lies at the foundation of its ever excuse me, of its own fixed qualities and changing circumstances. The superiority of a sub ictum as a ground line at the foundation that is preeminent because it is in an essential respect, unconditional, important, arises out of the claim of man to a fundamental absolutum, right? Veritatis, self-supported, unshakable foundation of truth you know, Cartesianism, right? In the sense of certainty, right? And for those of you interested here, you can compare this to Dewey, The Quest for Certainty, which I think is one of Dewey's best books, right? About scientific knowledge and scientific per pursuit in which this, this is taken up as well in a different way. Okay, why and how does this claim acquire to decisive, how does it get its decisive authority? He asked a good question. How does how does the Kogi, how does the cogito, which is our institution of the West, where everybody says I think, go to any meeting of academics, you hear the word I think 150 times in a period of a half an hour. I don't I I think that I think this I think this etc. You're basically speaking Cartesianese, if you will, you know? <laughs> yeah, in, in a sense, right? So this claim originates, and this is important, in that emancipation of man, right? In which he frees himself from obligation to Christian revelational truth and church doctrine to a legislating for himself that takes its stand upon itself. Through this liberation, the essence of freedom, that is, being bound by something obligatory is posited anew. But because in keeping with this freedom, self-liberating man himself posits what is obligatory. The latter can henceforth be variously defined. The obligatory can be human reason and its law or whatever it is arranged and objectively ordered out of such reason or that chaos not yet ordered and still to be mastered through objectification, which demands mastery in a particular age. Okay? But this liberation, although without knowing it, is always still freeing itself from being bound by the revelational truth in which the salvation of man's soul is made certain and guaranteed for him. Hence liberation from the revelational certainty of salvation had to be intrinsically a freeing to a certainty in which man makes secure for himself the true as the known of his own knowing. And this is a very interesting creative interpretation of the passage from Aquinas, right? <laughs> and, and church doctrine, et cetera, and revelational truth to self-certainty and the Cartesian uh, birth of the subject of subjectivity. This was possible only through self-liberating man's guaranteeing for himself the certainty of the knowledge, knowable. Such a thing could happen, however, however, only insofar as man decided by himself and for himself what for him should be knowable and what knowing and the making secure of the known, that is, certainty should mean. 
Descartes' metaphysical task became the following. This is very good, you know, and, and uh, I, I want to mention too, there's a good essay by Sartre on Cartesian liberty and, and others too. Uh, but he speaks of Cartesian freedom and he actually goes after Francois Mariac, a Catholic uh, thinker in this regard. Okay, the following, to create the metaphysical foundation for the freeing of man to freedom as the self-determination, the freeing of man as the self-determination that is certain of itself. That foundation, however, had not only to be itself one that was certain, but since every standard of measure from any other sphere was forbidden, it had at the same time to be of such a kind that through it, the essence of the freedom claim would be posited as self-certainty. And those of you that, you know, have, um, have, um, have read Descartes and read the discourse on the method, and of course the meditations on first philosophy, you get the idea of what Descartes is obviously eliminating, what he becomes skeptical of. You know, there are two doubts in Descartes. There's the methodological doubt, which takes, you know, its moment in terms of other knowledges to get to the self certain But there's also the hyperbolic that pushes everything to the extreme, you know, because the, the antagonists are really the skeptical tradition uh, during this period. So this bedrock on which Western metaphysics in our age is still founded upon is, is what Heidegger is really trying to, again, undo here and show, right? How this came to be and what, what it meant, you know, how this method started. And yet everything that is certain from out of itself, much at the same time, concomitantly makes secure a certain that being for which such certain knowing must be certain and through which everything knowable must be made secure. The fundamentum, right, very good, the ground of that freedom, that which lies in its foundation, the subictum, must be something certain that satisfies the essential demands just mentioned. A subictum distinguished in all these respects becomes necessary. What is the something certain that fashions and gives the foundation? The ego, cogito, ergo, sum. The something certain is a principle that declares that simultaneously, conjointly and lasting an equal length of time with man's thinking, man himself is indubitably co-present, which means now is given to himself. Thinking is representing, and going back to where we started with this, setting before is a representing relation to what is represented, idea as perception, right, or as perceptio. Right? To represent means here of oneself. And the, this is, he spe, he's in, inside Descartes here. Of oneself to set something before oneself to make secure what has been set in place as something set in place. This making secure must be a calculating for calculability alone guarantees being certain in advance and firmly and constantly of that which is to be represented. Representing is no longer the apprehending of that which presence within whose unconcealment apprehending itself belongs, the ancient, right, notion, right, belongs indeed as a unique kind of presency towards which presence that is unconcealed, which presence that is unconcealed. Representing is no longer a self unconcealing for, but is a laying hold, right, and a grasping of. What presence does not hold sway, but rather assaults the rules, right? And this is very much true. Again, I mean, I know we don't have time to, you know, go, uh, you know, into every little aspect of Rene Descartes' uh, thinking, et cetera. But I, I always suggest, you know, methodologically to really understand the scientific project and where we are, to read the rules for the direction of the mind, right? Of Rene Descartes, it's amazing. The level of the you know the quest for certainty there and the drive for certainty and then of course the discourse on the method all six parts of which he actually demonstrates how he found it in in uh, the third uh, the third chapter of the discourse on the method the third third section in which he he speaks about how he discovered analytical geometry using his method Right? Very interesting. You know, Descartes had mathematical discovery, you know, that analytical geometry that we learned was this combination of algebra and, uh, and geometry, you know, and he, he, 
he fused the two anyway. Very, very you know, very interesting. He also wrote, uh, you know, 350 pages on music uh, as well. Uh, you know, quite, 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 again, the thinker, you know, and, you know, we, we dismiss these people, but we don't really get into their, their thinking enough. So, so anyway, a going forth from out of itself into the sphere, first to be made secure of what is made secure. That which is, is no longer that which presents. It is rather that which in representing is first set over against. So, I mean, Carl and others, and I'm really glad Josh uh, pointed this out, um, you know, this, this section. This is really what he's really talking about here, that representation is a setting against that stands freely over against, which has for the character of an object, right? has the character of an object. This discovery of the object world by Descartes, one of his major contributions to the history of philosophy as well as the ecological region. region. But at the same time, Heidegger's understanding how this is happening, that, that the Greeks did not have this notion of representation, right? That it was very different in, in, their, in their, their moment, right, in, in a sense. And yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. One thing I just wanted to yeah, sort of sure. point out, and I, I don't yeah. know if this is right or not, but my reading of this was sort of that, you know, this changing of the idea of freedom right. to being against and over objects, because it, uh, freedom can only be self determined against an object, is really kind of the crux of what's happening here, right? Like, the Greeks it's didn't dominate have with the subject right. over the object. It's the right. early, early moment of this. Yes, yeah, so right. of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, I, and I think that that's like really what his what what he's you know angry about representation or or you know. Yeah. Um... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, book, 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 again, book five of the discourse on method. We have dominion. We have mastery over nature. Right. You know. Descartes makes note that the Descartes project, if you will, you know, since uh, Carl brought up what's the philosophical project, was really that we could have mastery over anything. It was really a, a, a kind of metaphysical therapeutic that he thought he was giving us the medicine for the future. He was the physician of the future, you know, really in a sense, right? That he was giving us enough power epistemologically to master anything. And you think about this in terms of, if you want to parallel this to a kind of historicity, you know, this is the beginning of the manufacturing era. You know, they needed certainty in a lot of things, navigation, right, et cetera. This is the very early beginning. This is 17th century capital at work, right? Mercantile <laughs> capital moving into manufacturing capital. So you can read this in a parallel way in many, many senses, right? Uh, yeah, to the, you know, the development of the, uh, of the uh, economic and, uh, you know, social forces, right? So I'm not trying to deny that at all. I mean, this is part of the, quote, you know, philosophical unconscious at times, but, you know, the phil philosophy is conscious of the, the concepts and how the representation is happening. But, you know, yeah, yeah. So go ahead, yeah, I'm just so yeah. Is, yeah, I'm really glad Josh brought this section up because so this I mean, all the sections are important, but yeah, go ahead, yeah. The idea of freedom then, freedom becomes the, uh, the freedom to dominate, essentially. Well, yes and no. Yeah, it's also the freedom of subjectivity. It's the birth of modern subjectivity. This is mm -hmm. the origin of modern subjectivity. Cartesian freedom is the birth of this. We, we still live in this, you know, self-interest, me generation, right? All these things are coming out of this still, this kind of subjectivity. And, you know, he mentions subjectivism later, which is a kind of very narrowness, right? In a way, subjectivity, in some senses, if we rewrite that or rethink that, might be an advance over the subjectivism we have, this very narrow domination, this kind of forceful domination rather than reflective subjectivity. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, this is what it leads to, is this calculated rationality that can dominate and, and, and overcome anything. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you see the medical, you see allopathic medicine coming out of this, right? You see, you know, the domination of nature, 
if it's, if it's constant. You know, the way doctors operate, the way the medical professions is all allopathic here in, in so many ways. It's very Cartesian in, in framework. Not only the mind-body, you know, distinction that he pulls off, you know, and, and the dualism, but at the same time, this kind of, you know, notion of representation and setting off oneself from the, from the object. I was trying to get out of this subject object completely, right? Yeah, completely. I mean, you know, this is this is underway and and, 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 and yeah, Dennis, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you think about it in terms of the medical establishment, <clears throat> it's a sort of ultimate form of calculability and rationality that there really is a drug for everything. There's a pill. And uh, what you have to do, and and it can also be it can also be tailored individually. But that's a system. That's a dom that's a system that dominates, and uh, all you need to do of the drug companies work to simply define. Well, first they work to define the illness, and they make up an illness, and then they work to uh, create uh, a drug to um, you know to uh, assuage the. Uh, uh, what they've, uh, you know, what they've, what they've created. Well, they're very, you know, they're and very to, good and uh, dialectically, us, but... right? Every drug needs to have side effects, so you need another drug for those side effects. So they, they've got this. Well, but also, but also, but also, but also, a lot of times, what they're doing is they're creating the, they're, they're creating a disease for which they now, for which they've developed a drug, which is a cure. Sure, sure. So that's what he's talking about, about the system dominating Absolutely. Yeah. A, a system that claims to be rational, but is ultimately irrational. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. But so, but this is what, what Michael, you said that Heidegger is trying to get away from the subject object dichotomy entirely. He's not trying to get away from it. He's deconstructing it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's really. Deep. I mean, you're 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 in the presence of an actual. I think one of the reasons Josh chose this passage is it's it's actually deconstructive maneuvers at work, right? If you read this carefully, he's undoing each step, right, in this Cartesian birth of an absolute certainty at the bottom, the ground of modern metaphysics and the and the and the and the ground of uh, first philosophy and, uh, and and epistemology, modern epistemology. Everybody in modern epistemology has to go back to Cartesian rationalism, right? And this is why he's he's very good again uh, <laughs> at looking at from from Cartesianism to the, the Leibnizian monad, the Kantian transcendental imagination, the Fichtean infinite I, you know, Schelling's notion of freedom and necessity, you know, which is kind of pre presages of a uh, four box. Uh, freedom is the recognition of, the, of necessity. So he's really doing this. These are very, very uh, solid, you know, step by step maneuvers. If you can read this in steps, I mean, that might be a good way of kind of looking at Heidegger. Heidegger is, is a step by step, very careful thinker you know, in, in many ways. He's really trying to undo. He has such a broad background in terms of the history of philosophy. And as the thinker of being, he is sort of orienting his understanding of the central moment in the event, right? That produced this kind of thinking. And then how do we get to this modern representational space, et cetera? And then how do we, you know, back to your earlier remarks, Carl, how do we basically reorient ourselves from this massive, you know, what he considers disorientation. You know, this is a symptomatologist at work. This yeah, is a doctor. I mean, again, yeah, no, this, yeah, exactly, I mean, again, yeah, yeah. Exa exactly. And and it seems that you know, and this this theme comes up, you know, at various points in the essay is this notion of, you know, this representation, this subjectification. I think that's what he means is, you know, the the set over against, right? And that it's, it's right. the subject that becomes uh, set over yeah. against. The world yeah. over and constitutes yeah. the world as knowable objects, and that then you know the world is you know the the prior passage you read of that same paragraph right um, to represent um, oneself to set something before oneself and to make sure cure what has been set in place is something set in place. This making secure must be a calculating. And then you know he goes on, and it, this seems to be kind of a, what I'm taking as 
what he's disturbed by. Like, like what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is like kind of like, what is the counter position that he's seeking to articulate? Because I, I, it doesn't seem. It's not a counter position. He's looking at all the positive. This is a, this is a complete rewriting of the history of wealth, Western ontology in many steps and in many lectures. So but he's, he's no, he's throwing out the baby, the bathwater, and everything else, you know, yeah. in this, in this uh, context, right? I mean, you know, in a sense. So he's not just building position, counter position, or argument, counter arguments here. It's way beyond that. In fact, Heidegger is not into argument. Argument. He understands the argumentum, but at the same time, he's trying to avoid the argumentum at this point because he again sees that as symptomatic too. You know, uh, you know, he's, he's really trying to, you know, go go beyond that, if you will. Yeah. But th yeah, no, no, I, I, I get all that. I mean, it goes back to like the very first sentence or the second sentence of the essay where he talks about, you know, every age has its metaphysics. What you know, it it understand what can what can it say about the world and what constitutes the nature of truth. Yeah. And it seems like his deeper project here is to overcome metaphysics as such. Absolutely. I mean, that's certainly where he ends up later on, right? And so I'm, I'm, but then it's it's interesting that where he goes is to the early Greeks, right? This this. So well, that's where he lands because he sees in them a, a a different kind of intuition, if you will. I mean, for him, it's a back to the pre-Socratics before you know the Platonic Aristotelian moment. For him, he wants to return to certain dialogues, and he does this in the introduction to metaphysics, a kind of, you know, a unity of structure, if you will, between Parmenides and uh, Heraclitus, even though they're very different, where he tries to bring together being and becoming, the verdant and, you know, the becoming and uh, as well as the as being. So this is very interesting, uh, you know, um, very interesting the way he, he goes uh, that way, he has nothing about the. Um, uh, um, he again, I, I, I hope. I mean, in some senses, look again. Uh, you know, uh, there are obviously going to be problems with any any thinker ultimately. But if you can think of this work as as a kind of step by step, right, deconstruction that's going on. You know, without uh, an exit, at least in the beginning, right? <laughs> yeah, he's going to go back to these kind of things where we have to think, what does it mean to be open, right? <laughs> what does it mean to be there in, in the world, right? And that openness, what does, what, what does this set up for us into the future, you know, uh, in a way? Because the, 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 the polos, in a way, is really the stake. And, and you know, for all, you know, we, we began today with the political and the philosophical. The polos as a pole, as the polemos, the struggle that is going on, is very much on Heidegger's mind here. But he wants to, again, ask the questions differently and not stay in the same old thing where, you know, uh, Sleepy Joe brings a package on infrastructure to Washington, and then he has a big conference with uh, the Chinese uh, later in the day. This is not where this is going, nor is it going into sectarian battles that, you know, have happened on the left. He's really trying to think, I mean, again, a real, a, a real new path here. You know, whether or not that path leads anywhere or if we're going to get to any kind of gold, I'm not sure. But as a deacon, again, this, this, where we have gotten to this abyssal plane in terms of the metaphysics of our era, epoch, right? This epoch. And let me just do this. For, for my mind, if you, if you do a history of being and you think of the three thinkers, right, in a sense, and I've, I've said this before, and I'll, I'll try to elaborate this more as we go on, but, you know, you can think of the modern world, you know, you have being, being as value Marx, right? Marx is really about exchange value, right, in a sense, the great deconstructor, if you will, of value. Nietzsche as being as power, right? And then Freud, of course, as being as a, as a desire, right? So you have these three moments that we're caught within desire, power, and value today. Now, 
is this going to keep us stuck, <laughs> you know, in this sending that this is where we all are? You know, Lacan tries to write an ethics of desire, the ethics of psychoanalysis, which is a very ambitious project. Nietzsche tries to write a transvaluation of all values that have to do with power. This is a will to power to my mind is Nietzsche's attempt to be the modern Machiavelli. It's a political treatise, you know, symptoms, many, many things. And we can, we can talk about this as we go on. And then of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the question of value in Marx, right? What, what is value, right? In, in a sense and not, you know, not, yeah. So, so anyway, for us to kind of, you know, th th this is one way of thinking, I, I guess, differently, if you will. You know, this is where he wants to go. Think otherwise. The, think from the position of the other. You know, think from the position of outside, right? In a sense. So, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so this is why he goes through this. But again, obviously, one antagonist, but a, a very, very respectable respectful antagonist, Rene Descartes, he's undoing, right? Even though he keeps going on. There's always this double reading going on, you know? Nothing but respect for the, the clarity and distinctness of, of Descartes' uh, thinking, right? It's very clear in his thinking, right? <laughs> in a way, you read him too. But Heidegger, again, undoing it. So if you can think of this as a project in some ways, at least here, how did we get to this? And as Richard pointed out, this whole story of the idols, right? What, where has it led us? Where are we? How has it blinded us in a different way? How has it uh, actually mesmerized us in some senses to the point of we were no longer here, right? And, you know, one of the great phrases of Marx that I love and our friend Bruno Gulli is not here tonight is Marx is a great uh, reference in the economic and philosophical manuscripts to the theoretician of the senses, right? to be the theoretician, it's a very beautiful passage about really the prehistorical to me in a way is that, you know, we, we, we don't have our senses. We're not really yet human. The debates on humanism and anti-humanism, we're, we're still pre-human in many ways because we have not really developed that capacity, that fullness in a sense, right? So, you know, uh, so th this is a, you know, something we, we could be doing a more. Yeah, let me let me just read a couple of more sections and I'll, I'll come say, back. Just yeah, very yeah. briefly, one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm kind of reading this text and some of the other things that I've read by Heidegger as ethics. What do you mean by that? I'm sorry, just, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I see the epic movie from you no, know, 1920 uh, till about 1976, uh, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah. No, just, just it, it seems like there's a, you know, that what I, what I find interesting is what are the ethical implications okay. of, of, of what, he's, what he's doing. I mean, you know, that the, 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 the attempt to move beyond meta, metaphysics I think is ultimately rooted in a, a striving for a kind of ethic, a kind of, a, you know, a rethinking of, of, of ethics of our, our place in the world in some sense, that he's trying to uncover something that is transformative. But yeah, that it's, that, that, that's, that's where I think what, what I'm saying is kind of yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. I mean, you know, he kept going back to Aristotelian ethos, and this was a constant. Book six of the Nicomachean Ethics was a consistent reading of his. You know, it's like Marx. Marx kept reading Aristotle's uh, uh, prior and posterior analytics until his dying day. In fact, he died with uh, an ancient Greek, uh, you know, the copy of the, uh, I think, the, uh, the prior analytics of uh, you know, the logic of Aristotle, the organon. Uh, and, uh, you know, Heidegger meditated on these things, book four of the physics, book six of the Nicomachean ethics. And this is where the thought crystallizes. And, and, and for him, it's very important to kind of think, yes. And what, what is this relationship again to the Aristotelian polos? What is this relationship, if you will, to, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the pol polemos and the polos together? 
right? How, how does this space open up? And you begin to see this too in, in texts, and we're, we, we're not reading, but I mean, it's a, a very profound essay, and you know, Jameson reduced it to the twofold instead of the fourfold, but the origin of the work of art, right? Or the Ursprung, you know, the springing forth of the work of art. So he speaks about, you know, uh, you know, more mortality and, and divinity horizon and ground in this in this essay and how the fourfold works in Van Gogh's Shoes of the Peasant. It's a reading of Van Gogh's Shoes of the Peasant, right? And, uh, you know, Jameson reads it as the twofold structure of struggling against the earth and <laughs> making the living. But anyway, this is, you know, yeah, that, that's fair enough. Yeah. In, in a sense, but yeah, so yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, you know, in a way there is a struggle for a, a, a third way, if you will, in his case, right? In the introduction to metaphysics, Germany was the space between the East, right? <laughs> the, you know, and, and he had, you know, in some ways he was favorable towards uh, Bolshevism, you know, in some ways he, he was not totally against Bolshevism, but he felt that, you know, both the USSR and Americanism, and Americanism more, because he mentions this constantly in his writings, but he thought that Germany was caught between those pinchers, right? And it needed a third path, right, in a way. And this is probably where Arendt, you know, had some, some kernels for her book on the origins. I, I don't like that book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, but, you know, you can see where it started, right, in a way you know, the two totalitarian, you know, governments that, you know, became part of the World War II, you know, Cold War uh, thinking, right? And especially in the, you know, the State Department here, right? Yeah. So anyway, let me just read just one little pass and I'll, I'll get to you. One you know, I just want to say, I just wanted to say something just to just to bring it back to a more practical application in terms of what he's saying, you know. Well, Nisus, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. In terms of the drug companies, you know, uh, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but uh, this uh, this series Dope Sick is pretty good, actually, about the Sacklers. And what happens in the series, what they keep coming back to is every time they're confronted with how dangerous the drug is, they manufacture a new use for it. So their, their, their putting together of this system is in a way a kind of, um, you know, they, there's nothing outside of the system. They keep manufacturing a new that's way right, and, it, and it keeps working. Yeah. There's nothing it's outside the, the system. They, they, yeah. Right, and it's yeah. not, and, and they manage to never confront the fact that it's irrational and killing people. They simply have a rationality that they keep uh, instituting that uh, that tends that, that that works because they're surrounded by other systems which maintain it. Billions it's quite interesting. Dollars. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David, yeah. Yeah, please. It, uh, just a quick thing. It strikes me um, in the the description of systems that we're going through and, and the way that, that Heidegger sort of conceives them that there's um and the uh, uh, like the manufacturing of conditions. And then the manufacturing of like addictive, you know, drugs to treat those conditions uh, gets to it where there's like a, there's no way to stop it once it's turned on, you know, like so nothing escapes it. And also there's like a, like a temporal and like a like a momentum sort of aspect to it where like you can't turn it off and turn it on once it's once it's engaged, it's it's engaged, right? So like a very quick like very silly example of this um, from my field, uh, pop culture, right? Um, there's a sitcom, uh, uh, they're not making new episodes anymore called The Last Man on Earth. And uh, the conception was uh, Will Forte is the last man on earth, whatever. And it's actually a very smart show going through some of the scenarios that would- What's his name, Will Forte, Strong Will? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Will okay. Forte. Okay. No, I'm just playing, I'm just looking at the names, yeah. yeah. It's well, no, the actor, the actor, not the character. I, I'll oh, okay, I see, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay. But anyway, one of the scenarios that, that they draw is uh, like a year or two after essentially everybody dies, um, all the nuclear power plants start uh, like imploding or, or whatever a nuclear power plant would do, right? Which is just like like this very funny sitcom-ish sort of uh, sci-fi-ish example of like a system in this exact way. Like you can't turn it off. Once these things are engaged, we've now changed our, our relationship to nature. It's now mediated through nuclear power in a way that we can't just step back from and not mediate our relationship to nature that way anymore. Once you're dope sick, you can't stop that system and turn it off and, and not anymore engage 
like the world that way, you know, like, so there's just this, this one particular aspect of systems that I think we're, we're like touching on without naming. And that's, yeah, you can't tap the brakes once it's on, it has to stay on. Right. No, good point. Yeah. 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 No, very good. Yeah. Dennis, you wanted to say something else or add to this or yeah. Oh, I just didn't. Uh, I just didn't lower my hand, but yes, oh, okay. I, I think that's a great point. And I think I think nuclear power is another great example, along with you know dope sick and along with the drug, the pharmaceutical companies, you know, of systems that uh, of systems that have their own momentum and can't be can't be halted, or very difficult to halt. Right. Let me let me just read a little bit more. Of this very long, and uh, again, I suggest. Uh, to go over this uh, slowly if you have some time. This is a very rich uh, section that uh, Josh uh, attuned us to the uh, uh, number nine of the, um, of the propositions. I'm, I'm gonna go to page, um, 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 page 151, the first paragraph. Um, now it has also been clarified in which sense man is subject and tends to be and must be the measure and the center of that which is which means of objects or whatever stands over against, okay? So um, man is no longer metron in the sense of the restricting of his apprehending to the encircling sphere particularized at any given time of the unconcealment belonging to whatever presence towards which each man presents at any given time. As subictium, man is the co-agitatio co-agitation, if you will, of the ego, right? Man founds and confirms himself as the authoritative measure for all standards of measure with which whatever can be accounted as certain, that is as true as in being, is measured off and measured out, reckoned up. Very interesting. The, again, the calculation, calculated right away. Freedom is new as the freedom of the subictium. In the meditations for first philosophy, the freeing of man to the new freedom is brought out into its foundation, the subjectium. The freedom of modern man does not first begin with the ego cogito ergo, right? So, so, nor is the metaphysics of Descartes merely a metaphysics subsequently supplied and therefore systematically, excuse me, externally built onto this freedom in the sense of an ideology. In the Col Agitatio, representing gathers all that is objective into the altogether of representativeness. The ego of the cogitari now finds in the self-securing together of representativeness in conscientia, its essence. Conscientia is the representing setting together of whatever has the character of object along with representing man within the sphere of representativeness safeguarded by man. Everything that presence receives from out of this representativeness, the meaning and the manner of its presence. It's on right? Namely, the meaning and matter of presence in representatio. The conscientia of the ego as the subjectium of the, excuse me, of the, um, Coagitatio determines as the subjectivity of the subjectium that is distinctive in this way, the being of whatever is. This is the birth of consciousness, what he's talking about. This is basically on consciousness and consciousness as intentionality and consciousness of, right? So meditations, right, uh, provides the pattern for an ontology of the subjectium with respect to subjectivity defined as consciousness or as conscientia, right? Man has become subictium. Therefore, he can determine and realize the essence of subjectivity, always in keeping with the way in which he himself conceives and wills himself. Man is a rational being of the age of the enlightenment, is no less subject than is man who grasps himself as a nation wills himself as a people, fosters himself as a race, and finally empowers himself as Lord of the earth. And that's Descartes uh, re rephrased to the dominion over nature. Still in all these fundamental positions 
of subjectivity, a different kind of I-ness and egoism is also possible. For man constantly remains determined as I and then we and you, I and thou, we and you. Subjective egoism for which mostly without its knowing it, the I is determined beforehand as subject can be canceled out through the insertion of the I into the we. Through this subjectivity only gains in power. In the planetary imperialism, right? And he uses this vocabulary, interesting, of technologically organized man, the subjectivism of man attains its acme from which point from which point it will descend to the level of organized uniformity and there formally, excuse me, firmly establish itself. This uniformity becomes the surest instrument of total, i.e. technological rule over the earth, right? The modern freedom of subjectivity vanishes totally and the objectivity commensurate with it. Man cannot of himself abandon this destiny of his modern estate or abolish it by fiat. But man can, as he thinks ahead, ponder this. Being subject as humanity has not always been the sole possibility belonging to the essence of historical man, which is always beginning in a primal way, nor will it always be. <laughs> fleeting cloud shadow over a concealed land, such as the darkening, which that truth is the certainty of subjectivity, once prepared by Christendom's certainty of salvation, lays over a disclosing event. And this is uh, his notion of arrivedness. It's a disclosing event, event as disclosure, not just happening, that it remains denied to subjectivity itself, to experience, denied to subjectivity itself, to experience remains denied. Okay, so th this is a very, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, passage here, how entrapped and ensnared we are by the ego, <laughs> consciousness, right, <laughs> object world, etc. And it's not only just the domination over, it's also the passages that it becomes even greater in terms of this passage from the I to the we, it becomes constantly reinforced, right? <laughs> Constantly done. Yeah, Richard, please. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you can see, you know, the fate. I, I, I remember that Colette Solaire's description that you like to, I know, of, of Heidegger and Lacan in the car. But you can right. see, you can see a, uh, why Lacan would feel an affinity for a thinker who is saying the whole dominance of the ego is in a way a misdirection. Yes. Um, um, you know, of course, Lacan is, is fighting against the um, domination of ego psychology, which is the model of, of a psychoanalysis that the Americans um, will, will, you know, use to dominate uh, psychoanalysis, um, the IPA, and, uh, and, and the reason why, uh, at least according to some people uh, who have deeply studied Lacan uh, for his turn to language so uh, in such a opaque way, I mean, he's, he's literally diving into the, uh, uh, into the, uh, into the wormhole of, of linguistic uh, you know the play of the of the signifier, um, and and you know just just you know it's, there's just a real affinity, or one can see how whether mistakenly or not, Lacan would see uh, an ally in someone who's uh, sees the ego uh, sees the, this particular dominance as being um, you know um, you know a, a gone wrong things have gone wrong yeah absolutely i mean you know uh, 
I mean, as uh, Freud said, the ego is not a master in its own house. So right. that takes care of the Cartesian certainty and subjectivity of the cogito, right? But That's at the same time, right. people still believe this. And, and, you know, he does mention in these appendixes, uh, I'll, I'll read another one too, since you brought it up, of ego psychology. Number 14, I mean, no, number 12, I'm sorry, page 153, um, he goes on, Americanism is something European. <laughs> it is an as yet uncomprehended species of the gigantic, the gigantic that is itself still inchoate and does not as yet originate at all out of the complete and gathered metaphysical essence of the modern age. So America is an underde underdeveloped giganticism in some ways to Heidegger. This is 1938. The American interpretation of Americanism by means of pragmatism still remains outside the metaphysical realm. So this is a kind of interesting approach to Americanism. And, and uh, I guess some of you know, listen, I, I, uh, uh, I, I, I haven't returned to John Dewey, but anyway, I was thinking of Dewey a lot because we have about you know 20 uh, books of Dewey from Stanley's library. And I, I've never been a big fan, but Dewey went to work with, you know, work, went to uh, Germany to study philosophy, right? Dewey is no thought. And he wrote a book called Experience in Nature, which he thought was the American being in time, or better than being in time. He would, he would talk about this. So this is kind of interesting that he would go on the means of pragmatism outside the world, metaphysical realm, in a sense, right? That Americanism has not even grown up yet, right, in a sense, in this giganticism in many ways. And I mean, this may be, you know, an interesting way of approaching where we are, why we have such leaders, you know, there are a lot of fools in Europe, but at the same time, you know, we're going to have uh, many more fools on the American political stage coming up uh, very, very shortly, uh, you know, and maybe the return of, uh, you know, Donald or Donald Jr., maybe even this time around, who knows? You know what we're going to be getting. I, I know it's going to be horrifying. Yeah, Richard, you had your hand up again. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. But I mean, you know, this is about made in USA ego psychology as well. Heidegger's version of it, if you will. You know, this kind of attack on the philosophical moment of pragmatism and uh, you know what what it might mean and its undeveloped underdeveloped uh, uh, notions. Um, yeah. So. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, great section, uh, uh, Josh. I mean, uh, all the sections are good representation, but this gives you a notion of, you know, this whole thing of, of, of calculative rationality and, of course, dominance, uh, you know, of, um, of, of, of nature in many ways. And they're not d discussing this at COP26, that this is a part, you know, uh, whatever that stupid uh, moronic uh, lobbying conference is, uh, you know, that's going on about climate change. You know, that, 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 uh, John Kerry will erase history for us. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah, anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can kick him out of Massachusetts, Patrick, uh, John Kerry, uh, you know, another clown on the boat, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Going forward. yeah. So yeah, Carl, you wanted to say something? Oh, just, yeah, I mean, just, just the way you phrased that, it was a good summary of why I, when I was reading this, you know, it made me think of, some of the Frankfurt School and their critique of instrumental domination. And yes, absolutely. Yeah, it seems like this is very much out of that same. Yeah, I mean, look, these are people that grew, sort of grew up together. They were antagonistic, right? In a way, Heidegger was a little older. Heidegger had a lot of students, right, <laughs> that were really going to his lectures. I mean, if you want to frame it in terms of a, you know, anecdotes uh, in, in a way. And the, you know, the Frankfurt School, you know, uh, borrowed a lot. I mean, to me, the Frankfurt School is a combination. I mean, more certainly Lukács is absolutely crucial to, uh, to uh, the Frankfurt School, history and class consciousness, and even the theory of the novel to Benjamin, you know, if you will, uh, very, very crucial as background. At the same time, Heidegger's deconstruction of Western metaphysics and his anti-epistemological, Cartesian epistemology is very important, you know, to the Frankfurt School, 
and you know and he kind of laid the groundwork in many ways you know even though they may have taken it in different ways you know heidegger never studied culture or industry or propaganda or, or whatever i mean he understood these things i'm sure but he never really wrote books about it he was more interesting in working through the history of philosophy you know adorno Horkheimer, you know, and others. This was not their interest in their lectures, even though Adorno, and these are all worth reading. I've, I've, I've uh, read two of them very seriously and perused three or four others, his lectures given in Germany, in Berlin, after the war. They are very accessible. His work on Kant's critique, I recommend highly. And I also recommend, of course, the lectures on dialectics, right? And the lectures on the negative dialectics as well. So, yeah, so these are these are ways, you know, and, you know, he mentions Heidegger often and, you know, in, so, in some ways, Heidegger becomes a kind of straw man, if you will, for Adorno, you know, helps prompt a lot of thinking and plays off of that. So, you know, again, it's interesting to open this up, but what I'd like us to get, I mean, one reason to, to, to read this is to see the step-by-step -step deconstruction and how valuable it can really be in terms of our own time. You know, what do we do? As Dennis Bro was talking about big pharma, you know, we're talking about addictogenic societies. You know, we'll see this in Stiegler later, you know, again, when we go back to Stiegler, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see this in terms of framing. Kittler is tremendously influenced by Heidegger. In fact, I'm going to find, I remember a very good interview of his, you know, in which he talks about Heidegger and his relationship to Heidegger. You know, yeah, yeah. And remember, there's a whole German school that we don't really have that much access to here. We all know Anselm Kiefer's work, but you know, Kiefer, you know, did the hut of Heidegger, the head of Heidegger, surrounded by mushrooms. You know, anyway, there's been a lot of engagement in many ways with this, you know, thinker from the Black Forest, if you will, right? <laughs> in, 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 in different ways. So um, anyway, I, I, again, I think that this, I mean, we can, we can, you know, maybe raise a couple of other, uh, 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 you know, uh, problematics next week, but we should, if you want to, we go into the question concerning technology. We can certainly return to this, um, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, somewhat next week. I, I mean, I was thinking of, you know, he, he again, um, um, uh, goes through so so much here, you know, in, in a way. Um, 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 and, and, you know, we, 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 we pointed out the, the antagonism and uh, I think very valuable antagonism towards uh, anthropology as a discipline, what he sees in anthropology. And again, I mentioned to you, and, and this is again in the Polka edition, you know, the reading of Antigone is, is phenomenal, you know, uh, in terms of a critique of the anthropocentric uh, nature of uh, modern modern thinking, thinking, right? In so many ways, and this is um, you know um, um, uh, page uh, one uh, one uh, sixty two uh, to about one seventy is reading of uh, Antigone, the ode to man, the ode to Anthropos at the beginning of the uh, of the tragedy, right? And this is where he tries to reconcile again Parmenides and uh, Heraclitus in a unity of structure, you know, which is interesting too, you know, where he's really trying to bring them together. Yeah. Just, just uh, one other thing yeah, that I'd sure. be like very um, interested in what other people think about this is this is kind of going back to page 118 where, you know, he talks about, you know, this, he's talking about the metaphysics and then the, the notion of the fixed ground plan and how that is, you know, a projection that sort of, is it in advance, that exists in advance of actual knowing. And then uh, later down on that page, he talks about he, modern physics is mathematical because in a remarkable way, it makes use of a specific, quite specific mathematics, but it can proceed mathematically in this way only because in a deeper sense, it is already mathematical. I thought that was very interesting, you know, that, that he, and, and what that implies about how, I mean, it seems like there's a critique of knowledge or a critique of epistemology there that's quite profound and, you know, reappears, you know, it's, it's like his critique of Cartesianism and representation. 
And this is sort of like him actually applying it to an understanding of modern physics. And I, I just I just found that very interesting. What what it, that seems mm -hmm. to imply, you know, mm -hmm. about how how he's thinking about how we constitute the world. I guess. I don't know if I agree with it, <laughs> but but it's interesting. Right, but I mean, you know, to go a little further here, and I, I think you know Patrick raised, uh, you know, the the whole thing of the natural sciences, right? There is a there is a obviously critique of the fixed ground plan in this regard, right? He is really trying to overcome that, and and you know, both through understanding, but also through a, again a a step-by-step -step de deconstruction. If you look at page, uh, you know, going back to the beginning of the essay, page 120, science becomes research through the projected plan and the, through the securing of that, that plan and the rigor of procedure. And I think this is very important to what you're addressing here. It's kind of summing up. Procedure and rigor, however, first develop into what they are in methodology. So again, this methodology used in the sciences, how we go about this, very little texts uh, uh, in terms of uh, reportage on the pandemic have really gone into the methodology of vaccines and you know, where we are, et cetera. The latter, the med methodology constitutes the second essential characteristic of research. If the sphere that is projected is to become objective, then it is a matter of bringing it to encounter, right? He's really talking about how one frames the object world and how something becomes objective, right? Bringing it to encounter us in the complete diversity of its levels, right? Of and inner weavings. Therefore, procedure must be free to view the changeableness in whatever encounters it. Only within the horizon of the incessant hyphen otherness of change does the plenitude of particularity, that of, of facts, right, show itself. But the facts must become objective. Hence, procedure must represent the changeable in its changing, must bring it to a stand and let the motion be a motion nonetheless, nevertheless. The fixedness of, fa fixedness of facts and the constantness of their change as such is rule. Right? The constancy of change and the necessity of its course is law, right? And begin to think about this, how we go about procedure, what, what is really at stake there. It is only within the purview of rule and law that facts become clear as the facts that they are. Research into facts in the realm of nature is intrinsically the establishing and verifying both of rule and law, methodology, through which a sphere of objects comes into representation as the character of a clarifying on the basis of what is clear, that is of explanation. Explanation, here you go, is always twofold. It accounts for an unknown by means of a known, right? And at the same time, it verifies that known by means of that unknown. Explanation takes place in investigation. In the physical sciences, investigation takes place by means of experiment, always according to the kind of the field of investigation and according to the type of explanation aimed at. But physical science does not first become research through experiment. Rather, on the contrary, experiment first becomes possible when and only where the knowledge of nature has been transformed into research, only because modern physics is a physics that is essentially mathematical can it be experimental? Because neither medieval doctrine, doctrina nor Greek episteme is, is science in the sense of research, for there is never a question of experiment. To be sure, it was Aristotle who first understood what empiria meant, ex experimentia means. The observation of things themselves, the qualities and modifications under changing conditions, and consequently the knowledge of the way in which things as a rule behave. But an observation that aims at such knowledge, the experimentum, remains essentially different from the observation that belongs to science as research. From this research experiment, from the research experiment, it remains essentially different even when ancient and medieval observation works with number and measure, and even when that observation makes use of specific apparatus and instruments. 
For all, in all of this, that which is decisive about the experiment is completely missing. The experiment begins with the laying down of a law as a basis. To set up an experiment means to represent or conceive the conditions under which a specific series of motions can be made susceptible of being followed in the necessary progression, that is, of being controlled in advance by calculation, the, the part you were talking about earlier. Yeah, controlled in advance. But the establishment of the law is accompanied with reference to the ground plan of the object sphere. That ground plan furnishes a criterion and constraints on the anticipatory representing of the conditions. Such representation in and through which the experiment begins is no random imagining. That's why Newton said, the bases that are laid down are not arbitrarily invented. They are developed out of the ground plan of nature and sketched into it. Experiment is that methodology which in its planning and execution supported and guided on the basis of the fundamental law. I won't go on, but I think you get the point here. Again, the difference. Yeah, Richard, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I just, you know, what resonates for me is having looked um, a little, spent a little time looking at the Greek for um, ex um, experiment, which Heidegger yeah. raises, is that in the Greek, you have a sense of, you know, of really being out there, that experiment has a sense of, um, of a kind of, I mean, what he seems to be setting up here is it's almost as if you avo you're avoiding a certain kind of, uh, uh, of uh, encounter, you know, you're, you're pre-planning you're pre, uh, yeah. uh, in a certain way that to avoid some kind of, uh, um, experience that the experiment needs in the Greek, you know, there's a, uh, you're, there's something so prophylactic in right. the way that Heidegger describes system here. I'll put it in uh, for psychoanalysis, I guess maybe it'll help, help. It's like going to the analyst, you know, we talked about the good session when we were doing the anti-Oedipus, the, the notion of what made really good psychoanalytic sessions. The psychoanalytic session that never works is the pre-scripted Right, right. You're, you're missing the encounter. You're missing actually the experience exactly. itself. Right, in a way, you're guarding against that. And this is one of his bones to pick, if you will, with modern science. This pre-calculated space, this object world to define the ground plan, etc. What does the analyst want to hear from me? What does the what does the, the you know the the populace want to hear from from us? Right, in a sense. And this is what it becomes. And again, it becomes representation rather than the danger, as you say, of the encounter, you know, which is, you know, can be very creative. The danger of the encounter is a better way of looking at what experiment and experience means to the Greeks. Whereas yes. here, it's a controlling, if you will, through pre-calculative, right? Uh, you know, hypotheses that can change, you know, they'll say, oh, it's failed, you know, you know, all this going on, you know, uh, one thing I follow at times is all this uh, designer drug culture, you know, that you have in all these startups that big pharma then buy out, you know, these little, you know, MIT ventures or Stanford or whatever, Caltech, uh, you know, come up with all these new startups that, that you know, try to uh, come up with new drugs, right, for cervical cancer or whatever. But again, you see the calculatedness here, never really the full, you know, again, encounter. Right, and it's always mathematized to begin with. Right, so in some ways, yeah. In in one way, you can argue, you know, that Heidegger is always thinking poetically. He's trying to dwell poet poetically, right? Not mathematically, even though he understands the mathematical ontology very well. And unlike Bajou, you know, who we, you know, have talked about, where the ground, if you will, or the the basis of ontology is more mathematical than the poetic, right? For Heidegger, it's the poesis and the praxis and that movement that is always at stake. Or the poesis and the phronesis too. Very, very important to go back to the prescriptive. So yeah, no, very good point, yeah. And you see this, I mean, you see this and you know, people go into uh, uh, many, many events just completely prescripted, right? So the encounter is really missed, right? <laughs> You have nothing but missed encounters. And this is why I'm totally for the short session of Lacan. 
you know, in a sense, right? Yeah. Because you don't have a problem with the missed encounter that way. <laughs> you don't have a choice, right? And he figured that out, right? I mean, you know, this is yeah, very, very interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, in many ways, right? Because if it's about your anxiety, you're not supposed to go in there guarding your anxiety or, you know, partially experiencing it, right? And to be able to read, read that is a, a very, very good point, yeah, of, of his and intervention. Yeah. Anybody else? I know it's getting late. You know, you know me. I can go on if I don't have anything on the other end. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is a. I think it's a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, uh, text to say mildly. And I, I hope you get. I mean, look again to me. It's good to follow the thinking. You know, no matter who we're reading. You know, you know, Kittler is going to be easier. Stiegler is very rough because he plays that French game and in translation, it's not great. You know, they're always creating new levels of abstraction as they write. But but anyway, um, I think it's good if we can just follow the thought, we get more more out of it, you know, in a way. I mean, I try to not superimpose. I mean, we all bring a prejudice to the text, but at the same time, if we can try to just follow the thinking, what he's doing, it would be very valuable. So I, I, I yeah, I recommend this with a question concerning technology. But again, I think this is a very fruitful essay. This, this is very early on, you know, again, before the war, right? Before the advent of the domination of cybernetics, cybernetics is, is happening, but not to the level it does that picks up after the, the construction. You know, I, I don't know, there's, there, uh, there's a very good text on the construction of the social sciences. It was brought to you by Wiener, Bateson, <laughs> right? These people after World War II, Lawrence Kuby, uh, psychoanalyst in Baltimore, um, you know, many others, they, they put together these projects that were very much about social control through communication theories, yeah? So this is, a, you know, again, a very interesting thing. And Heidegger saw this as an enemy. He really did see cybernetics. He did not like the idea of translation machines. He hated that. He hated, you know, this kind of automated learning. He would be totally against this Zoom culture. I know that. You know, I can see him screaming in the black forest or taking the walk with you know, the cane and hitting the you know, ground or something, right? So, uh, but anyway, um, all to say, it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's but one of the things. Just yeah. like when we uh, reconvene, you know, that I would if other his language is so interesting. Yes. And I, I sometimes feel like we could just, you know, slow down a little bit and almost just yeah, sure. some of the sentences and try and unpack. Yeah. I'd like to unpack. Yeah, yeah. I, I can, yeah, we can do like, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes there's like so much. Yeah, I know Patrick can do that. I know Richard's yeah. got the, the Greek to do it too. So yeah, yeah we can unpack. We've got a good, good, uh, good working uh, model here. To, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. What were you going to say, Patrick? Yeah. <laughs> no, I would like to clarify his use of the word being in the different senses of being. Because there's being, there's there is, there's Dasein, and there, they, there, there's subtle differences. And there are many, many subtle and the, differences. The, tr the trouble is the translation doesn't catch them. You know, no, it does. It, there's Zein, Zein des, Dasein, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Very, very Dasein analytic. There's ex and then there's existentials, mm -hmm. existentialia. This is a very, again, a very creative uh, project of neoliberalisms, <coughs> and at the same time, you know, a very creative effort here, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I found a a PDF of of the, the in German, and I've, I've been going through it and trying to follow some of that, but it's it's just it's just confusing. So. You're reading Zion und Zion in German or this German? No, 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 this essay. Oh, yeah. this essay, yeah. 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 Well, no, the, no, the, I'm not the, reading it. I'm this, following this, in this, English and checking. You know, it's like, you know, right. I go back and forth. It's Yeah, yeah. well, the, the Zeit is time. It's not the age. Oh, it's no, I got, time. yeah, that's easy. Yeah. Time, time of the, the world picture, right? And Welt and, and picture, again, it's really world imaging. Right in a way is a better translation too. Because what about a relationship with Weltanschauung? Well, he, he, he's, 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 he's juxtaposing the two. Yes, 
He is. He is. But at the same time, he's he has an argument against that too. Oh yeah, unpacking the, the psychology of worldviews, which he got into a big argument with Carl Jaspers about that. He wrote a, a a thing on the philosophy of the worldviews. He wrote a long essay about this is not the way to think, right? In a sense, uh -huh. because it leads to historicism, and he was very much against historicism. He saw a consequence of worldview thinking ending up in historicism, right? Yeah. And that comes through in this essay, because in a way it acts as a kind of foil. Right, yeah. right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean by historicism in, in that, in this context? Well, you form a worldview in, in, in the context of the immediate or the imminent time you're living and it, 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 it sticks you in that, you know, you, you lose your, what Heidegger would call your historical character, your historical sending. Yeah, it takes away from any kind of apocal thinking or, you know, it takes away from the possibility of overcoming uh, metaphysics. One becomes limited through this. Right? I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, one so. thing I found just this is something he uh, lecture he gave much later, but I was it, I was looking for sort of uh, he, he did a lecture called Time and Being. Where well, that I was going to go there after we finish the technology piece. Yeah. You know, talk a little bit about Rising. the reversal. Rising. This was a, a very crucial point. You know, that Heidegger you know reversed the order. Right. <laughs> it was no longer the question of being. It was the question of time. Right. But it, it helped right. me understand some of what, yeah. you know, grappling, like this, this underlying problem that he's so perturbed right. by. I mean, he's obviously, you know, this is his life work of trying to... Well, he makes the distinctions between temporality, you know, uh, time, <laughs> you know, there, there are many, many, again, levels. This, I mean, again, the, the you know, uh, uh, we did, uh, uh, Phil was there, who else? Uh, David, I think, uh, was there. Sean was certainly there. Uh, I think Chris uh, Miller came. We did about 21 se sessions on being and dying. You know, so we, we, we did this about uh, five, six years ago. You know, we went through it line by line. You know, most of it was all in person. Uh, I think it's up on YouTube. I, I thought it was, you know, in, in retrospect, pretty damn good, especially, you know, the, the, the sections and introducing the text and then some of the crucial areas of it, you know, and I, I uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, I thought, I thought it was pretty good. So there's about 60 hours, you know, on that, you know, Hubert Dreyfus has done work on that in English too. Uh, you know, I don't know about any other, you know, straightforward commentaries, but all to say, you know, he, he's obviously the thinker of, you know, his one thought is to think by being, right? And, you know, uh, the, for Nietzsche, being was an empty fiction, right? And, you know, uh, I know a professor of mine uh, went to see Heidegger and asked him if being was God, right? <laughs> you know, and Heidegger was completely silent. And maybe being is complete silence. I, I don't know, you know, how we would ultimately define being. Uh, but I mean, to think of being, right, uh, again, uh, uh, is really his, his, uh, one, his one project under the horizon of time. In the end, the reversal that you referred to is to, is to, um, is to, um, is to think time, right, <laughs> as the, the horizon, and sometimes the being is no longer there in the horizon. Right? He, has, he has this great... Uh, what is it? Let me just say, uh, <clears throat> being is determined as presence by time. Right, right. Being is right. determined as presence by time. Right. So there's, yes, it's it's kind of a yeah. very interesting essay and it's short. <laughs> you like the shortness, huh? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, I don't have time. These, to... these are multiple steps that you're both... <laughs> yeah. uh, Descending yeah. and ascending with yes. Heidegger and well, being in time, I'd like to read it, but not. Let me, let me just say this. I know Josh left, but number nine is is absolutely crucial that he that he pointed out to read. I also say number eight is crucial on the sophist, you know, in the appendix. You know, we didn't have really time to go there. We'll be here till ten thirty if I if I start on that. So anyway, uh, thank you, Beryl. Good to see you. Uh, anyway. Um, 
the, the sophist to the impossibility of subjectivism and sophism. So this is a very important uh, uh, appendix too. And maybe we can start there and then make the transition into, uh, into um, the, um, the, uh, on the essence of technology. I'll talk to Matt for a second afterwards. I wanted to figure out how to put up some notes and uh, you know the reading and some of the crucial terms too. Okay, thank you, David. Yeah, good. Oh, David, before you go, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, you know, this thing for Stanley, I, excuse me for just a second, everybody else. Uh, the thing for Stanley on, on, um, on uh, Friday, I, I, I was able to negotiate an open space for students to speak about Stanley if you, if you wanted to participate. We we're taking maybe about 10 to 12 key people that we thought were very, you know, close to Stanley and had followed his work and, you know, will probably continue, you know, uh, you know, uh, being quote influenced or whatever. <laughs> so uh, would you be interested? I will put your name on the list. It would be from three, uh, I think three to four on Friday, if you're available. Right? I, I'm definitely available. We'd be very okay, happy. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. okay. Thanks All for right. thinking. Sorry, Michael. Yeah. Okay. No. No problem. I just wanted to let you know. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Thank you. I'll see you Friday. Oh uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 And I mean, there are twelve hundred people that have signed up. So. Oh wow. Uh, nice. Twelve hundred people are going to show up, but you know, uh, you know, twelve hundred people have, have uh, you know, um, actually registered. So. That is yeah. that is a yeah. big number for a one day symposium. Yeah, wow. that is the yeah yeah. yeah. Wow. Is, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, okay. Great. We should have fun, I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so what I'll what I'll do is uh, it, uh, uh, we can go over this. Also, I would like to talk uh, as well um, um, about um, the use of uh, violence here. You know, Gavalt, how he defines violence. You know, in in history and his violence, and 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 this is going to be good to um, uh, go forward. Uh, um, uh, you know, towards Walter Benjamin, who, you know, plays on his own name in the Critique of Violence, a very beautiful essay that he wrote that's in the uh, volume called, uh, I think, Reflections, and as well as in the Collected Works, but I'll, I'll speak to that when we get to him. Okay, and let me just say this, uh, you know, he did give a lecture, a winter seminar, on the concept of nature, history, and the state, and this is where I got the notion of the erotic urge for the state. He thought of the, the political as an erotic space, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. And again, to go back to where we began, this whole flirtation, and, and more than a flirtation, I'm being very kind, uh, you know, to National Socialism, you know, he always envisioned very early in 33, 34, the, the, uh, the Plato's guardians, the philosopher king. This has really come somewhat of the model. So you can think of this also in terms of the psychology of power, you know, overtaking this man in a certain way, you know, the powerful thinker and then the powerful position and what he might be able to, you know, represent. But uh, anyway, he goes through, um, you know, um, 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 uh, you know, many, many notions of the historical time too. And I, I'm always reminded of, uh, that great uh, section in Reading Capital of Althusser, historical time, very much influenced by Heidegger's notion of historicality against historicism to go back to this, the notion of the historical time. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that too, you know. So uh, yeah, and I, I'm, I, you know, and, and again, um, um, the project Carl in, in some ways for Heidegger is to really think with the Greeks again. You know, this is very clear, you know, in terms of his project, but it's to think in German with the Greeks. The French don't begin to think until they think in German, he said this publicly. And he was a very old man. But he wasn't as arrogant as he was as a young man, but he said this. The French don't begin to think until they think in German, right? This is in a Der Spiegel uh, interview in 1966. French don't begin to think until they think in German. So you can imagine, you know, the French philosophers on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. 
<laughs> they, all, all, they all rush like Patrick back to the German text. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. All right. So uh, any other uh, comments? I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm here. I mean, I, I, I hope this is, uh, you know, fruitful. I mean, I, I hope, uh, you know, it, it opens up some pathways for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And uh, yeah, good. And it's Chris, thank you. I got to say in a personal way. Today. Yeah, what's that, Carl? I'm sorry. Oh, just in a personal way, you know, I, I, I studied philosophy as an undergraduate and, you know, that was late 80s, early 90s, when deconstruction was all the rage and the French had been imported into the academy. It's fascinating to read some of this stuff and see where it all came from in some way. Right, and right. It's like, sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, reading the original text and everything else is just kind of a footnote. To, you it, know, it's true. Know. What the academy did, to, to my mind, is really destroy, decontextualize, and also destroy the thinking itself. And the use and, and so many secondary and primers were used and didn't really get to the depth or the you know yeah. the richness of the primary text. Yeah. And this was something yeah. really worth worth thinking about, you know, yeah, going forward. And many careers were built on this, as we yeah. know. Yeah. You know, it, it was a it was a machine, you know, or in, in a way. And a lot of jargon. This was the horrible part about it. You know, I, I really respect the fact that, you know, Patrick here, who has a background, you know, can cut through the jargon and see what's going on back to the dill thighs or the natural sciences, you know, empathy and understanding and all this. Yeah, very few people that were able to do this or et cetera. I'll tell you a story. I mean, this is anecdotal again, but a story about a good friend of mine who was a Faulkner scholar and he was going out with a, a very, uh, you know, um, um, star kind of literary critic, you know, at the time, University of Texas, Austin, and uh, they were discussing Joseph Conrad and they were discussing Heart of Darkness and uh, they were having this long conversation. And then he said, do you remember this part in the novel? He says to his partner. And she says, oh, no, I, I never read the, the novella. Yeah. She just knew the theory. She yeah. just read the literary criticism around it. And the conversation would go on on that level. But once it came to the primary text, forget it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, anyway. yeah. The representation. <laughs> yeah. But, it just sorry? The representation. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> representation of representation. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that used to really piss me off, you know, when I got to graduate school about, you know, people's responses to Marx, because they had all these ideas about Marx that, you know, was a totalizing theory that, you know, and they had never read jack shit. I mean, it was right. obvious they had right. never really read it. And right. yeah, so, yeah, no, this is great. It's actually good. Really good. good. Yeah, well, good. Yeah, well, we're reading two two primary essays that really regard, you know, the question of technology, really about, you know, technology and, you know, how he, he frames technology ultimately, you know, as as it's become technique and it's become more technics than techne, right? And that is not, and we're going to go back to this notion of danger and unconcealment. And the closer we are to the danger, the more possibility for liberation. But we'll 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 talk about this when we we get there. But this is a nice, you know, I think the age of the world picture of the time of the world picture is a uh, good opening, you know, before going to the 55 essay. Yeah, yeah. And you'll see all kinds of things, the mediation of nuclear stock, you know, what he's really thinking about, you know, uh, watching build up, you know, the, uh, the uh, agrarian, the, the, the destruction of the land. You know, th this is a man that's hurting, you know? I mean, you know, in many ways, seeing what's going on around him. And was taken up by many of the climate activists. You know, you would think that, Climate uh, change was just brought up five years ago. Anyway, back in the 70s, Heidegger was very, very prominent in ecological movements, really taken up very actively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, still is in some some places, but yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I uh, thank everybody and uh, yeah, see you, uh, see you ne next week. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be here. Matt, 